Welcome to the biggest Unexplained Encounters episode in the last year. You see, for the last half of 2022, I began keeping track of stories that I especially enjoyed. I hope you like this compilation of those scariest stories I read in 2022. Which one do you think is the creepiest? If you want to support our show, all I ask is that you leave an honest rating and review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts for Unexplained Encounters. And be sure to send us your scariest stories of the unexplained at darkstories.org. Now, let's begin. Bigfoot is a Shapeshifter From C.J. Mullins I'm no writer, but I'll do my best to describe what I saw. I live on a mountain in West Virginia. Only three households live up here. All of us retired, and between us, we own just over 20 acres. Our property borders the summit, a 10,600-acre property owned by the Boy Scouts, and that property borders 70,000-plus acres of maintained, preserved wilderness. Naturally, there's a lot of wildlife in this area. My husband has chickens, and because he likes to keep tabs on what might be messing with them, he keeps a trail cam posted near the coop. We see raccoons, foxes, we've seen a bobcat, a mountain lion too. DNR will tell you West Virginia doesn't have them, but we do. I saw one last summer running across my yard. We've seen a lot of coyotes on it, and every so often a bear. Now, the layout of the property is important. The three households own a lot of land, but our homes are situated in sort of an upside-down triangle from my point of view. The neighbor at the top left of the triangle has his home situated far back from the entrance of his gate, and I've never seen any source of light coming from there at night. The neighbor at the top right and up a slight hill has a dusk to dawn light, and we at the bottom point of the triangle have motion lights. When we built our house, we had an attached garage, but later my husband decided we needed a three-car garage behind the house. He's a retired carpenter and gets bored, so he invents things to build. I took full advantage of this and turned the attached garage into my craft room. Last Friday night, I was sitting in my craft room doing my thing. I like to listen to YouTube videos while I work, so I was picking out a playlist on my iPad. It was about 10.30 at night, very dark out, and I had the garage door up because it was warm. The only light was the light spilling out of my garage and a bit of my neighbor's dusk to dawn light which from my viewpoint only lightly illuminated part of the drive leading up the hill. My nine-year-old beagle was sleeping on the floor next to me when he began to growl. We've had him since he was six weeks old, so I've heard him growl before, but never like this. I looked down at him, and then in the direction he was looking. It was standing in the middle of my neighbor's driveway, about halfway up the hill. I instantly knew that it wasn't a man. It was, I would guess, about seven and a half feet tall. I'm bad at that, but that's my best guess. The thing was standing on two legs, and due to the dim light, I couldn't tell if it was facing me or facing the other way. I know bears can stand up. I've never seen one do it in person, but I know they can do that. But this thing didn't look like a bear to me. It wasn't really fat enough, I guess. It was bulky, but not fatty like a bear. I then realized I was on full display under the bright lights in that garage, so I took four steps to hit the light switch. When I stood up though, it moved. It didn't run, but walked rapidly. It did look like a man walking, but again, this was not a man. I stood frozen, focusing my eyes on the area it went in. It walked into the wooded area between the two points of the triangle between my neighbor's drives. I don't think its fur was black. I got the impression it was a dark brown. Once my eyes adjusted, I could see a shadowy shape in the wooded area. Then I saw it go from a dark color to a lighter one, and for a split second, I mean, if I had blinked, I would have missed it, I saw the shape of its head and shoulder area change. It wasn't like the American werewolf in London, slow and painful looking, but it happened extremely fast. It then dropped down, and a few seconds later, the biggest coyote I've ever seen walked out of the area, stopped, looked straight at me, then trotted off into the woods to the left. 
I know, if a coyote had been in the patch of woods, it would have ran out when that thing ran in there. I also know that I saw that thing change. I never believed in shapeshifters. I thought it was just scary stories kids told each other. As far as Bigfoot, I've never had an opinion. I like to believe in him, but didn't ever expect to see one. And I also don't drink or do drugs. I know what I saw that night. I just can't wrap my mind around it. I had my husband check his trail cam, but that thing didn't come near it. I had my cell phone lying next to me on the table at the time, but all of this happened so fast, I didn't have time to try to get a shot of it. Then again, I don't think it would have picked up anything. It was just too dark for a phone camera. If I'd thought to grab it when it was in the middle of the drive with the dim light behind it, I may have gotten a shot of its form, but I just didn't think of that in the moment. His Guardian Angel from Bubble Guppy. Ghosts aren't always malefic. Some are downright kind and gentle, just like the one from this experience. This was one of the last times I went camping. It was with my cousin, his girlfriend, and my boyfriend. My cousin is 39, but he was always my favorite, because he always went out of his way for me. For this to make sense, I need to tell you about my former roommate as well. Her name was Alice. She and my cousin were always so sweet together. He was 33 back then, and me and my roommate were both 22 then. Alice and my cousin always joked around with each other, like throwing cold water over her when she was taking a shower, or Alice hiding somewhere and scaring my cousin. But when we'd all watch a movie, Alice would always sit next to him and put her head on his shoulder. Now, my cousin is peculiar when it comes to people putting their head on his shoulder, so you can tell he really cares about someone if he lets them do that. One day we heard that Alice was in a terrible accident. She was taken to the hospital. When we arrived there, her family was sitting in the hallway and the doctor asked if we were Gabby and Russell, and we answered yes. The doctor said, she won't make it long, so please make it short. When we finally saw Alice, it felt as if my heart stopped. She was wired to so many machines. Alice smiled though, and stuck out her hand, grabbing Russell's. He sat next to the bed on the stool. I walked to the edge of the bed. She said, I love you, Gabs then turned her head to Russell, to which she then grabbed her bracelet, took it off, and put it in Russell's hand, saying, I love you so much. I wish we could have been together, but I'll always be with you. She ended up passing away right in front of our eyes not too long after. My cousin Russell wears that bracelet every day and only takes it off when taking a shower or a bath or when he goes swimming. He even got a tattoo of Alice's name with angel wings on his right peck on his chest. Fast forward three years, my cousin Russell finally had a girlfriend after the death of Alice. Eloise and Russell were an official couple for three months at the time, and my boyfriend Eddie and I were together for a full year then. Eddie wanted to go camping with me, and I suggested Russell and Eloise come with us. After all, Eddie and Russell are like two peas in a pod when they're together. He of course said yes. The next day, Eloise and Russell showed up with camping equipment. We went to the biggest forest nearby, setting up tents. Then Eddie and Russell began looking for big rocks and wood to make a fire pit. Eloise and I could hear them joking around while looking for the required items. Then Eloise said, So has uh, Eddie asked you yet? It was clear that Russell told Eloise that I wanted to get married pretty soon, but before I could answer, Eddie and Russell came back. Eloise, did you know your boyfriend's crazy? Eddie said. We saw Russell holding a big pile of rocks. Eloise looked at Russell with a face that just said sarcastically, really, and he dropped the rocks on the ground. As Eloise stood up, Russell walked to her and just kissed her. Eloise then said to me, okay, I won't say anything. Later on, Russell cooked the food they'd brought. We sat on the ground starting to tell each other scary stories. After the stories, we went to bed, but since those scary stories tended to get under my skin, I had a bit of trouble sleeping. 
those kinds of stories tend to make me kind of paranoid, and I start wondering about things that might happen. Eddie slept with me, and that did help me feel better. He told me not to worry, and I answered back with an, I love you. The next day, I was the first to awake, or at least I thought I was. Eloise then woke up and asked me, Good morning, have you seen Russell? No, I thought I was the first one to wake up, to be honest, I replied. I looked around to see if Russell was anywhere, but I didn't see him. We went on with our morning, assuming that he would come back at some point. But a few hours passed, and I could see Eloise was beginning to get restless. Where could he be? She said, worried. I tried to comfort her, saying he probably went out and maybe fell asleep somewhere. She managed to smile, but anyone could see that it was fake. More hours passed, and Eloise finally decided to call the cops. Eventually, a search party was formed. The cops allowed the three of us to join in. A few hours into the search, I saw something glinting in the little sunlight that still shined. I ran up to it and saw it was the bracelet that Alice had given Russell. My heart was pounding. I heard an officer then shout my name, and I put the bracelet into my pocket. Ma'am, we're going to have to stop the search now. It's going to be dark soon, and tomorrow we'll come with the dogs to find him. The officer explained. My heart sank. I was so scared of what could have happened to my cousin. When I arrived back at the campsite, I found Eddie trying to calm Eloise down. She was crying. She never stopped crying until she fell asleep that night. Eddie and I lay in our tent. Then Eddie said to me, We'll find him, okay? I'm sure he's fine wherever he is. I lay on my back trying to fall asleep, but it was soon clear that I wouldn't be sleeping that night. Eddie was fast asleep, though, and I could hear the slight snoring of Eloise coming from the tent next to ours. I picked up the bracelet and held it up, whispering, Where are you, Russell? No sooner did I say that, I heard what sounded like a whisper on the wind. I could have swore I heard the words, Follow me. I got up suddenly and called out, Hello? I didn't hear any response, but I did feel the bracelet hit the side of my hand, which was weird since I hadn't moved or touched it, and there was no wind coming through the tent. Then I swear I heard it again. Follow me. I threw on some clothes, opened up the tent, and stepped out. Then I froze. There was a figure standing in the distance. At that distance, I could not see any features, but I took a step forward, and at this, that figure took a step back, but I didn't hear any footsteps. Once again, I stepped forward, and same as before, the figure stepped back. I gathered my courage and called out, Who are you? But I didn't hear a voice in response. Something else happened instead. The bracelet hit the back of my leg, which surprised me. I grabbed the bracelet off the ground. That's when another windy whisper came. Trust me. My mind was blown. I wasn't sure if it was even real, what I was hearing. Alice had always said that to me when I was afraid. My mouth agape. I then swallowed and gathered my courage again. I spoke. Alice? Is that you? Then I heard a giggle, and I smiled when that giggle sounded familiar. There was no mistaking it. That had to be Alice. Was she here to help? I began walking toward the figure, which I was now sure was my darling departed friend, Alice. I followed her, trying to ask her questions like, Where are you taking me? But all I got was giggles, until she stood still and so did I. Come, I heard her voice say. Steadily, I walked up closer to the figure, and as I drew closer, it became clear to me, this figure truly was Alice. I felt a tear roll down my cheek, seeing her standing in front of me after all this time. She then turned her face to the left. There, she said. I walked over to where she was looking, after a few steps, I noticed a hole in the ground. I shouted, hello, hello, into the hole. 
suddenly, I was greeted by another familiar voice. Gabs, Gabs is, that you? is that you? I was both relieved and startled. I shouted back. My God, Russell, yeah, Russell are, you okay? are you okay? What happened? What happened? He replied. I fell down here. Fell down here. Hurt my ankle Hurt my pretty, bad. pretty bad. I can't even stand on it, but you need to help me out of this hole. I put the bracelet into my pocket, putting my hand into the hole. Russell was just barely able to reach it, and I managed to help Russell out of the hole. He looked at me, and he asked, How did you find me, Gabs? I grabbed the bracelet out of my pocket, showing it to him. Guess who? He smiled and said, It was Alice? I smiled back. I think so. I think I saw her, and she led me to you. Suddenly, a gentle breeze picked up only for a moment, and I heard what sounded like, I love you. I turned to Russell, asking, Did you hear that? He was smiling, just looking right in front of him. We walked back to the campsite as I supported him on his hurt ankle. Halfway there, the sun began to rise. I asked, How did you even end up in that hole? Well, I was picking up wood to start the breakfast fire. I ran into a boar of all things. I just started running away from it blindly. I looked him straight in the eye, and he put on his I did something stupid smile and continued. The boar chased me. I was zigzagging through the trees, but it kept on running after me. I ran through a few branches. That's probably how I lost the bracelet in the first place. I just kept running. A big ray of early morning sunlight was now shining through the trees, creating a breathtaking scene in front of us. Russell and I just sighed, looking at each other. I smiled and hugged him. Then Russell said, Alice loved to see the sunlight through the trees like this so much. Then one final time, the whisper on the wind came to us. Thank you. The two of us quickly turned around, and we saw her standing there, looking back at us. Then, we heard Eloise shout behind us. We turned to her and saw her running at us. She threw her arms around Russell, crying her eyes out. Eddie hugged me, saying, My God, where were you? And where'd you find him? We told them how I found Russell, except for the parts where Alice helped. To this day, Russell still wears the bracelet, and even calls his first daughter, who is now a year and seven months old, Alice. When she's old enough, Russell's going to have his daughter wear the bracelet, and have Alice be her guardian angel. The Visit from Sam Me 5 I was born and raised in Chicago, as in the actual city, and not some suburb close by. I only say this because I feel as if most ghost stories happen in the middle of nowhere, or where the population is limited, never in the middle of busy city life. I live with my parents. They own a multi-family home, and we live on the top floor. My dad bought the house in the early 90s, and it's been in the family ever since. We've never lived anywhere else, and we certainly never plan on leaving. It's a great house in a good neighborhood. I love this house, and besides some minor details about it that make it old, I wouldn't change much. That being said, the house has always had a somewhat unsettling vibe. It's not all the time, but certain times of the year, you could feel it more than others, especially at night. Growing up, I remember experiencing creepy things in the house, like seeing shadow figures make their way across the hall when I was playing, hearing footsteps walk from the kitchen to the dining room, hearing the shuffling of things being moved around. My parents were a bit skeptical if I ever brought it up, even when things like this happened to them, they brushed it off with a shrug and said something along the lines of, It's an old house, it creaks. I never truly believed it was just that. I always had a rule for myself. Never stay in the living room past 1am. And if I ever did because of homework, all the lights had to be on. Even then, out of all those times, I was all alone studying in the living room or den area, 
I always felt something watching. I always knew I wasn't alone. The presence in the room was almost tangible, and it gave me shivers down my spine. The best thing I could do was play my music and try to ignore it. But I'd always practically run to my room once I was done. Some might think it was all in my head, that I was just afraid of the dark, but it wasn't that. When I left for college, that feeling of something watching me was never there in my dorm room or in my apartment when I eventually began to rent a place. It was only ever there when I was at home in my parents' house. What truly convinced my mom that there was truly something in that house was when I had just come home from college for Thanksgiving break. Everything was fine until the third night I was there. I had this habit of staying up late at night watching Netflix. That night was no different. Normally, I never closed or locked my door. I kept it slightly open to let the room breathe. On that particular night, though, I closed the door and I locked it. My parents had done the same. They always did. It was sometime around 2 or 3 a.m. that I heard my parents' doorknob beginning to jiggle. My parents still had one of those old doors that came with the house, and the doorknob was one of the ones made of glass that was kind of heavy. Because it was an old door with a heavy knob, it was loud and creaked when opened and closed. It was practically impossible to make the door any quieter. So when I heard the all too familiar sound of the glass knob turning, I knew I was in trouble. Crap, I thought to myself. My mom was probably coming in here to yell at me to go to bed. It wouldn't be the first time she'd done it. So being my sneaky self, I quickly turned off the TV, hid the remote underneath my pillow, wrapped the blanket around myself, and pretended to be asleep. I remained silent, hearing footsteps getting closer, and then they stopped at my door. The doorknob turned slowly. There was a small jerk of the door. It was locked so the door didn't open. I expected my mom to use her nail to turn the lock. It wasn't hard to do, but it never happened. It felt like forever as I waited, and the room had become incredibly dead silent. All of a sudden, I get a weird feeling in the pit of my stomach. Slowly, I looked at the door, focusing my hearing on any noise outside, listening to the footsteps that my mom should have made. But nothing happened. I couldn't hear anything. I'd suddenly become slightly afraid, and there was no way in heck that I would check it out myself. So I forced myself to go to sleep, wrapping the blanket tighter around me. The following morning, I woke up. I heard shuffling in the kitchen. I knew it was my mom, so I quickly jumped out of bed, and I made my way over to where she was. Before I could even get a word out, she said, what did you want last night? I looked at her, confused. What do you mean? I asked. You came to my door last night trying to open it. I kept calling out your name, asking what you wanted, but you never responded. Were you sick or something? This time I nervously smiled and chuckled. No, no, you came to my door last night. I didn't go to yours, I countered. Sam, stop messing with me. Mom, I'm not. I, I thought you were coming to yell at me to go to sleep for being up so late. You turned the knob too, but the door was locked so you couldn't get in. I did no such thing, my mom said, and neither did I. We just stood there, looking at one another as if trying to see who would confess, but neither of us did, because I know for a fact I did not get up to go to their room, nor did my mother come to mine. So, you're not lying to me, because you do like to scare me sometimes. My mom asked, looking a little more anxious. No, mom, I'm not. If I ever scare you, it's certainly not at two in the morning. <sighs> okay, then, she said quietly. I could tell my mom was now confused and slightly concerned. Whatever came to visit last night failed, thank God, she added softly. I don't know what tried opening both our doors that night, 
but I was thankful it wasn't able to. I have no idea what I would have done if that door had actually opened. All I know is that whatever had been lurking around at the house all these years had finally mustered up the courage to do more than just walk around. But it had failed, and I'd rather keep it that way. Ever since that day, two new occurrences had begun to happen. One, there's always a subtle knock on the back kitchen door. It happens throughout the day, but when you look outside from the window or cameras, no one is there. We've made it a rule not to open the door under any circumstances, unless we know someone is there. Two, the bathroom door randomly opens now. It's never done that before. We even had some of our family members who work in construction take a look at the door, and they always say the same thing. There's nothing wrong with the door or the lock. Whenever it happens, it always freaks us out. The door opens with such softness that it's nerve-wracking. The creepiest part is when you realize the lock is still in its locked position. I still love this house. It's a great house, but it can be a little creepy at times. We've thought about bringing a priest, but the strange activity has become so normal at this point that we don't see the point. We've learned to live with the creepiness. Bordeaux Springs from Jake P. I worked for the National Park Service for almost 30 years in three different states. My final stop was at a national park in Louisiana. I don't want to say which one, but anyone familiar with the Park Service can probably figure it out. I was transferred there as deputy director, put over a sector of the park where we had a lot of campgrounds and hiking trails, but not much else. It was basically dense thicket for miles and miles, as far as the eye could see, and always had been, at least in living memory. Some of the veterans who worked in and around my sector told me some interesting stories about things that had happened there over the years. Mostly pretty tame things. Stories about people who claimed to have spotted panthers or Bigfoot in the park. People who had uncovered substance fields or certain types of labs, if you catch my drift. Not that all that isn't interesting, it's just that you hear those kinds of stories a lot in my line of work. But one story that really stands out from my time there was the legend of Birdo Springs. As the story goes when the first white settlers were coming into the area, they maintained relatively peaceful relations with the native Choctaw people. But the natives insisted that the whites had to stay away from one area, a natural cold spring they called Nanushta, a hole in the ground that the natives claimed was bottomless and was home to bad spirits. But eventually, a wealthy plantation owner named Bordeaux was granted the deed to Nanushta and all the land around it for service to the French crown. He passed the land to his son, who eventually built up a large and prosperous sugarcane plantation he named Bordeaux Springs. But the enslaved men and women who worked the land told wild tales of the spring the Choctaw called Nanushta, and rumors spread that children had begun to disappear from the slave quarters in the night. The slaves, many of them practitioners of Haitian Vodou, held ceremonies imploring the evil spirit who lived in the spring to spare the lives of them and their children. Bordeaux himself, it was said, became increasingly cruel to his slaves, punishing them for what he saw as satanic practices. The slaves, for their part, spread the rumor that he had become possessed by the spirit in the spring. Eventually, it all came to a head one night when Bordeaux's youngest daughter, Marion, staggered into a neighbor's home one night, covered in blood and ashes. She claimed the slaves had risen up against her family in the night, butchering her family before her eyes and shackling her to a tree. The neighbors sent for reinforcements from the nearby military outpost, and by noon the next day they were marching off to Bordeaux Springs to put down the insurrection. However, when they arrived, there was hardly a sign of life on the whole estate. The manor house had been torched. Nothing of it remained, save a smoldering blackened ruin. The slave quarters, too, had been razed to the ground, along with most of the crops in the field. 
Strangest of all, however, was that the slaves on the plantation before fleeing into the dense hardwood forest had taken a considerable amount of time and effort to stop up the spring, burying it under a massive amount of dirt and detritus. According to the legend, the bodies of the Birdo family were never found, with many supposing they'd been tossed into the spring before it was stopped up. Over 200 years later, by the 1980s, they said that nothing remained of the Birdo plantation or the springs, except a grown-over heap in the middle of the woods, somewhere in the depths of the park. Many have searched for it, and some even claim to have found it, though they could never do it a second time. But in the early 90s, a professor from a state university had contacted the park director, claiming he had finally pinpointed where Birdo Plantation had once stood using satellite mapping technology. He requested permission to conduct a rudimentary excavation at the site, which the park director granted. Time passed, and the director forgot about it, until the professor and his wife were reported missing. During the investigation, the police noted that the last phone call he had placed from his home number was to the park director. A search was conducted, using the coordinates the professor had given the park director, and nothing was ever found. No signs of an excavation or campsite. No sign of anything that might be the remains of Birdo Springs. After a week of canvassing the area, the search was abandoned, as there was no proof the professor had ever been there to begin with. He and his wife had simply vanished without a trace. After a while, the incident passed out of memory until years later, when a camera was found hanging from a branch on a trail deep in the park. The trail place where the camera was found was a long way out, but not a trail that was infrequently used. It was definitely a place that people passed every two or three days during peak camping season. The people who found it said it was hung there quite purposefully, like someone had placed it there and would be back for it shortly. They ignored it when they passed it on their way in, but when it was still there two days later on their way out, they decided to pick it up and turn it in to the ranger station. The camera was placed in the lost and found, forgotten about for a couple of years, until someone came across it while cleaning. They realized there was still film in the camera and decided to have it developed on a whim. When the photos came back, everyone was puzzled at what they saw. The photos seemed to show what appeared to be an older middle-aged man digging in what looked to be a small mound or hillock, showing various bits of broken pottery or tools he had uncovered. As the pictures went on, there were also several images of him pointing at what looked to be some kind of spring, and even cupping his hands and drinking from it. Then things got really strange. The last several photos seemed to show that same man walking around the outside of an antebellum home, pointing out different design features. The pictures became more and more overexposed nearer the end, gradually fading to all white. Obviously, this was a little weird, but as you've probably guessed by now, this wasn't just any middle-aged man. Some of the pictures were eventually posted to the park's website in an attempt to find the camera's owner. And you guessed it, the man in the pictures was later identified as the missing professor. The police were alerted, but of course they couldn't make heads or tails of it. No one could. There are no antebellum homes within a hundred miles of where the camera was found. And to this day, no accurate explanation has ever been offered for the strange photographs or what became of the professor and his wife. In all my years at the park, no sign of them has ever been found. I don't know what to think about it all. Honestly, I try not to. Not Abandoned From Seeing Things Whatever term suits your fancy, I'm what you may call a wanderer or a drifter. I've been wandering the country since I graduated high school, jumping from place to place, finding work wherever I can get it. It's not what a person would call stable living, but I do what I can to get by. You can imagine having traveled so much that I have a lot of stories, right? Well, yeah, I do. I've seen and experienced so many things that no one can explain, 
ghosts, ghouls, I have many stories of the unexplained. But for the sake of time, I will stick to telling this one for now. Living on the budget of a drifter isn't always comfortable, especially since hotels are so expensive these days, so most nights I have to find somewhere to camp. I enjoy the experience, especially on late spring nights when it's cool out and you can stare off into the stars as you fall asleep. It was on such a night that this series of occurrences happened. I was in a small town in Colorado. It was about 7 to 7.30 p.m. when I noticed the sun was going down. As per routine, I walked into the woods looking for a place to camp. This evening, I was pickier than usual with my selection of camping spot, which led to me walking for what felt like miles into the Colorado foliage, enjoying the scenery and wildlife, until I came to a strange sight. A gas station. I whispered to myself. After walking as long as I did, through trees and other plants I couldn't name, it was shocking to find an old rusted gas station in the middle of nowhere. The place was in shambles, and looked like it would fall over at the mere sign of wind. The gas station looked like it was constructed in the 60s by the look of the design. Nevertheless, the place was rickety, and I didn't want to stay the night there due to fear of waking up and being crushed under it. However, Mother Nature wasn't having it, and before I knew it, rain began to fall. Left with such circumstances and night rapidly approaching, I took shelter inside the gas station. The sound of the rain smacking the metal roof echoed in my ears as I entered the building. Entering from the front, there was a large countertop with shelves behind it. To my left, there was a door that went into the garage portion of the station. The whole place was empty filled only with a strange smell and cracked black and white tiles for flooring. It wasn't the coziest of places, but it beat sleeping in the rain. The only other downside, besides it being a dump, was that there was a bent part of the garage door that opened a crack for possible slithering friends to enter, and the last thing I wanted was to be bitten by a snake in my sleep. So I decided to sleep to the right of the counter, in front of the main door using my sleeping bag as a mattress. It was when I lay down that I got this strange feeling that I needed to leave right away, as if the building was on fire or there was something dangerous nearby. I ignored this and allowed the exhaustion from walking all day lull me to sleep. What a mistake that was. I awoke to the sound of growling outside the building. It took me a while, but as soon as I realized what it was I was hearing, I became fully alert. Having passed encounters with wolves and even bears, I always kept a knife with me for protection. Knife in hand, I tried listening to the growls to identify their source. It didn't sound like a bear. No, this sounded bigger. The growls were some of the deepest I'd ever heard a creature make. What could it be? I asked myself. But before I could think of anything, the growling stopped and a deep distorted voice repeated just outside. What could it be? It was as if it was trying to imitate me. Quickly, I rushed to roll up my sleeping bag, placing it inside my backpack. As I continued packing my other things, the sound of the metal garage door being grasped to the point where I heard it bend, followed by the loud screeching of it being opened upwards, rang in my ears. I put on my backpack, running out of the front door through the rain and into the woods. While I ran, I swear I could hear the same deep distorted voice laughing loudly in the distance. I'm not sure for how long I ran but eventually I made it back to the small town where I went looking for the police. I found the local sheriff parked next to a diner in his patrol vehicle. I guess he could tell I was a bit shaken, so he brought me in for dinner, sitting me down in a booth, buying me a meal. Once I'd finished eating, and I had calmed down a bit, I told the sheriff what had happened. He laughed, looking out the window, taking a sip of his coffee. Then he spoke. The old gas station, huh? 
yeah, that place is not abandoned. My seventh birthday from Anonymous. I'm from the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, really right next to Lake Superior. You could probably guess back in 1991, there really wasn't much crime there. My parents, as well as other parents, always let their children wander either alone or in groups. I was born in June, and so every summer my birthdays were always outside, at the beach, or barbecue-type parties that usually lasted all day. That year, my seventh birthday was no different from the others. That was the year we decided we'd go to the next town over, just a couple miles away, to a place called Alqual Recreation Area. It was off the highway a bit with an elementary school on the same property. It's a big place. There were lots of trees to climb, trails to walk, and a big pavilion you could use for parties. Lots of playground equipment too that was older, but was still considered safe to use and fun. There was a small paved kind of wide bike path that wound around the whole place. It was a favorite place to go for sure. While my parents were setting up at the pavilion, some family were just starting to arrive. I could tell my brother was getting tired of playing with his little sister. So I asked my mom if it was all right if I just sort of walked down the bike path a ways, just a bit over the hill. Sure, just stay close where we can see you. I remember her saying that to me. Okay. And that was it. I left my brother to hang with the cousins while I walked off on my own a bit. It was such a sunny, bright afternoon. There really was no darkness on the bike path. But I didn't see the white pickup truck parked on the bike path until I'd actually got to the bottom of the hill, out of my mom's sight. Why I kept walking towards it, I have no idea. I remember seeing that truck, an older type of truck, maybe a 60s style with a cap over the truck bed. I could see it over the roof of the truck as I was walking towards the front of it. There was a man I could see sitting on the bench that the truck was pulled up alongside. He looked like Santa to me, and he was whittling a piece of wood. I got pretty close and was going to turn around, when I was surprised by a little girl. Hi! She popped out from behind the truck and practically screamed it at me. The old man didn't even look up. I looked at him, and he just kept whittling. This little girl was so enthusiastic, and she was smiling. Now, this is a small town. Everyone looks fairly familiar. But I'd never seen this truck, nor these two people before. Still, I smiled back and said hi. I remember we had some unmemorable kid talk when she quickly said, Oh, hey, want to see something great? I answered, sure. The girl very excitedly started to tell me the grandfather, who was the whittler on the bench, had built her and her brother a little space in the back of the truck. She wanted me to see it. I was a pretty shy kid that got picked on a lot, and I think I was so desperate for a friend, I didn't even think about how I've never seen them before, or any other dangers or red flags. Seven-year-old me was just happy to have a possible new friend. Maybe her family just moved there, and this would be my chance to have a friend this summer. She took me around the back of the truck, where the tailgate and the window to the cap were already open. We both climbed in. I went as far back on my hands and knees as I could in front of her. Somehow, she had closed the tailgate and the window in one motion. I don't even know how she could have done this. She was so small and only seemed maybe a little bit older than me. I just stupidly shrugged it off. There was a bucket with crayons and pencils and a tiny table and a tiny set of chairs. I, for whatever reason, expected more. I said something along the lines of, Oh, okay, this looks nice. Well, my mom is going to be looking for me, so I think I should get going. Then I started to reach for... Wait, I didn't know how to open this from the inside. The girl went from happy to a weird, creepy smile. She suddenly didn't look like a little girl anymore. I started to feel that, uh-oh, feeling you have when you know you screwed up. I tried to put my hands on the window of the truck topper, 
and every time I did this, the girl would laugh a really creepy laugh, swatting my hands away. I was really crying at this point, and I started to bang on a small side window on the topper to get the old man's attention. At that point, as the girl's laughing is growing, along with my panic, the old man proceeds to get up and put the stick in his pocket. I thought, great, he's going to get me out. But he didn't. He didn't go towards the back of the truck at all. He started walking around the front of it. I began to scream at the top of my lungs. This girl just kept laughing. I still remember her face as she laughed at me, telling me I could not leave. As I was sitting there gasping now and looking around frantically, I could hear my mom's voice. I jumped around the girl and quickly banged and screamed as loud as I could on the side of the topper. I could see my mother at the front of the truck talking to the man who didn't seem like he cared about much when she heard me. Thank goodness she did. She immediately walked around the back, letting me out of the truck. I jumped out and she grabbed me as the truck started and this girl and old man drove away quickly. I really can't say what happened after that. I know my mom and dad calmed me down, and my dad and some uncles tried to follow the truck after my mom told everyone what happened. But nothing ever came of it. Nowadays, I'm always cautious of new places, and I'm always looking for an escape route just in case. I never get into cars with people I don't know. Looking back, maybe my seven-year-old brain just thought the girl looked like a little girl. Maybe she was just someone who aged really well, keeping her youth longer than others. Maybe she was just a young-looking woman. She was a bit taller than me. Why did the man not say anything? How did this girl get the tailgate closed so quickly and easily? Who knows if they would have been working together to take children. But I know without a doubt if my mom had not come looking for me, I would have been gone. Switching Seats in the Dark From Christina I'm not usually very good at telling about something that happened to me, but I'm going to give it a try. There was an incident that happened about eight or nine years ago that still sends chills down my spine. I was a 23 or 24 year old girl at the time. We lived about an hour out of town back then and cell phone reception was sketchy at best. Most of the time you couldn't get reception at all. I am a bit of a nervous person so not having cell phone reception already made me nervous. I always hated having to drive home in the dark in fear of breaking down in the middle of nowhere. Sadly, because we lived so far out of town, it was usually dark. My mom was the one that drove most of the time, because I only had a permit and only drove at night when I had to. That may seem weird for me to have had a permit at that age, but medical problems made it so I wasn't able to learn to drive before then. Before I could get my license, I got injured, and I still can't drive to this day. Anyway, on to the story. My mom and I were driving home late one night after a long day in town. We were about 30 minutes from home, so we'd already been out of reception for quite a while. My mom didn't get a lot of sleep the night before, but she was the one driving due to the fact that I only had a permit. She started to fall asleep in the driver's seat. Usually, I could just talk to her to keep her awake. When my mom was so tired that talking no longer worked to keep her awake, she began to swerve off into the wrong lane. I yelled and she woke up, but I was still having a lot of trouble keeping her awake. I suggested that I should drive the rest of the way, and she agreed. We were both a bit nervous, being out of reception in the middle of nowhere and having to switch seats because it meant we would have to get out of the car in the dark, and most of the area had thick trees. We knew we had no choice, and within a mile or two, I saw a big open area that was far away from any trees. So I felt confident that if someone or something were to come out of the trees, we would have plenty of time to get away. We stopped there and got out of the car. 
For some reason, I felt unusually comfortable, and I didn't hurry like I usually would have when it was dark. I got into the driver's side and shut the door. Now, in this car, all doors had to be all the way shut, or none of the doors would lock. My mom took a quick look around, then got in her side. But, as she shut her door, something began to pull on the door from the outside. I could not lock the doors, because her door was not yet closed all the way. I couldn't figure out what to do, and suddenly she screamed at me to drive. It felt as if I couldn't get out of there fast enough. I must have been going 70 on a 50 mile per hour road for about 2 miles before I finally felt safe enough to stop in the middle of the road just long enough for my mom to shut the door. I also suddenly thought about the fact that my window had been down at the time, and it terrifies me to think what would have happened if it had come to my window. I think the scariest part of the whole thing is the closest trees or bushes of any kind for anyone to hide in were at least 300 feet away. I'm pretty sure there's no human or animal of any kind that can get to the car in what had to be less than a second, and whatever it was had to have had hands to be pulling the door open. To this day, I'm not sure what it was that wanted in our car, or what would have happened if it did get in. This scares me so much because I feel a human getting to the car fast would have been impossible, and it had to have had hands to pull the door open. I don't feel that whatever wanted in our car that night was human. I've never really been a believer in creatures like Bigfoot or any other weird creatures people claim to see, but I do admit after this, I have to wonder, what else could be out there? And why did it want in our car? The Haunted Villa from Nina W. It was summer vacation. My family decided to book a villa, as they do every year. If I'm not mistaken, it was 2009, and my grandmother had just passed away from cancer. She had breast cancer, and she'd been fighting this illness for two years. She was such a strong and inspiring woman. I can still remember her strength in mind and spirit and confidence, and that she would survive this illness. Unfortunately, she passed away, leaving our family broken and torn apart. A few months after her death, my family decided it would be a great idea to once again go on a family vacation. When my grandmother was still alive, we'd book a villa somewhere isolated and spend an entire week with the family together, drinking, eating, taking long hikes through nearby woods, it was always great to be spending time together, making the family bond strong. Only after the death of Granny, our family members rarely talked. Mobile phones were not common at the time, and Granny usually brought us all together when we'd visit her at her apartment. My brother and I didn't want to go at the beginning. We didn't want to spend time with our nieces and nephews who had never tried to get in touch with us anymore. Our parents changed our minds when they decided that we could choose the villa. My brother and I eagerly accepted the offer, and so we roamed the internet for hours until we found the perfect destination. It was a large five-story house with a large garden that had a small pond, a decent-sized swimming pool, and a small forest at the edge of the garden. This house was old, built in the mid-1930s, and renovated and modernized a few times over the years. It had six bedrooms, two huge bathrooms, a large modern kitchen, a wine cellar, which had a big lock on it so I could never seem to open it. Downstairs had a dining room which had a large piano and a living room, which overlooked the beautiful square in which the house was situated. In the attic was a large playroom, which had a ping pong table, a few game consoles, and a large dollhouse. This dollhouse was so large a grown man could easily fit in it. To be honest, it was everything a nine-year-old child could wish for. We'd be staying in the house with 12 people. My three nieces, Jisoo, Lori, and Dahlia. My nephew, Peyton. My brother, Ezra. My two aunts, Jane and Nicole. My two uncles, Frank and Peter. My parents and the two dogs. Kiara was a black Labrador belonging to Jane, who's very territorial and can be aggressive if provoked. Otherwise, a sweetheart to those she trusts. The other dog, Chico is Nicole's. 
Chico is a small black Russian terrier who was easily spooked and almost always aggressive. He'd almost always bark or growl, but would bite you if you came close to him. My aunt Nicole had found him when he was a little pup in the forest near her house. He'd been beaten and left by his original owners. Nicole took him to the vet and stayed with him until he was fully recovered. Chico became attached to her, and so she brought him home, much to Uncle Peter's dismay. Chico only trusts my aunt and will always stay by her side and protect her at all costs. Anyway, we arrived at the house early, and Peter called us, telling us they'd be running late because Chico had become ill on the road. My parents, along with Jane and Frank, decided it would be best that we get a drink at the restaurant while waiting for the others to arrive before entering the house. As we ordered something to drink, Jisoo, Dahlia, Ezra, and I pulled out our Nintendos and started playing Mario Kart. Our parents began chatting away with the bartender, talking about our plans for the upcoming week and the villa we would be spending our time in. As the bartender heard in which house we'd be staying in, he raised an eyebrow and said, Are you folks sure about that? That house is believed to be haunted. Spooked at hearing this, I looked up for my game, falling far behind in the race. Haunted? I asked the man with a shaky voice. Oh yeah, it's been haunted for years. This entire square has been, as a matter of fact. During World War II, the church you see in the middle of the square had been bombed. During the wartime, the folks that lived here decided it'd be best to build tunnels that would lead towards the church. When a warplane would be spotted, everyone would flee into the tunnels and seek shelter underneath the church. Little did they know that the church would fall a victim to the bombing and would be coming down on their heads. It's said that almost all the people living on this square were killed. You can still see the damage on the church's roof if you look close enough. How tragic. My Aunt Jane would mutter. I can still feel the cold shiver that had went down my spine when I heard that story. I'd always been a believer in the paranormal, but I'd never expected to actually visit a real haunted house. I could, however, see the excitement in my niece's eyes. When the other half of the family finally arrived, we went to the house. The house lived up to our expectations. It was grand and beautiful, with a wooden floor that would creak if you walked over it, a large staircase that had a hand railing which was decorated with small iron flowers and huge chandeliers in every room, which would cast small rainbows on the walls. Jisoo, Dahlia, and I took off in a dash through the house, exploring every room, opening every door, and arguing who was getting which room. The rooms, however, were huge. None of them were particularly small, but some rooms had double beds, while others had bunk beds. Ezra didn't want to share a double bed with me, so we were left with the smallest room at the far end of the hallway far away from the two bathrooms and the staircase that led up to the playroom. Our parents called us downstairs and told us they would be going to the store to buy some food for the coming week, and that Peyton would be in charge while we were gone. He was the eldest, after all. We agreed, and when our parents were gone, we took off in a mad dash up the stairs to the playroom in the attic. Ezra and Peyton started playing on the game consoles, while Jisoo, Dahlia, and Lori started playing ping pong. I went to play with the dollhouse, I was the youngest at the time, and a bit of a weirdo. I didn't always like playing with the others, as they would often ruin the stories I had in my head. So I climbed into the dollhouse and began playing with the dolls that were inside. I was so caught up in the story I was playing, I didn't even notice that the others had gone downstairs. I only really noticed when I heard Peyton and Lori's voices coming from underneath me. At that point, I crawled out of the dollhouse, searching for where the sound was coming from. There behind the dollhouse was a hole in the wood floor. The hole was big enough to fit my hands in, and it gave me a perfect visual of the room Peyton and Lori were in. They were unpacking their stuff. I wanted to shout at them and wave, but I chose not to. I didn't want to scare them. So instead, I went downstairs to unpack my own stuff. That evening, after we'd eaten dinner and watched a movie together, we all decided to go to bed early. We were all exhausted from the three-hour drive it took to get here. However, that night around 2 a.m., 
we were awakened by Lori screaming her lungs out. When we all ran to her in Peyton's room, we found Lori crying in Peyton's arms. When Nicole asked what happened, Peyton told their mother that Lori claimed to have seen someone staring at them from a hole in the attic, the hole that I'd found. Lori, trembling, shook her head. No, I didn't just see someone stare at us, I saw someone reach his or her hand through there. Lori then pointed at the hole in the ceiling with a shaky finger. I woke up because I heard whispering. When I looked up, I saw someone's hand reaching through the hole. Peter, Frank, please go look in the attic. Nicole asked politely of the men. My father and Jane went downstairs. That night, we searched the entire house and checked every door. But there was no one, and every door was locked up. It would have been impossible for anyone to get in. Lori and Peyton decided to sleep in the bedroom with their parents, and we all helped move their stuff. The next morning, I decided to go up to the attic to check if there truly was nothing up there. And there was nothing. No sign that someone else had been there. The dollhouse was even just as I'd left it the day before, and every doll still lay where I'd placed them. A little bit spooked, I went downstairs to eat breakfast with the other members of the family. Lori still seemed on edge, her skin as pale as a ghost, and her lips trembling as she ate her breakfast. That morning we went to the beach, and as we were walking on the sandy beach, Jisoo, Lori, Peyton, Azra, Dahlia, and I started talking about the thing that happened last night. We decided that it would be a smart idea to stay up the coming night to catch the ghost in its act, and Scooby-Doo style reveal that it was just some simple person playing a prank on us. Naive, I know, but we were children back then, and this seemed like the best thing to do. That night, we gathered all our snacks and drinks and snuck in the room of Jisoo and Dahlia. Our parents had told us not to stay up too late before heading to bed. We were left in the lone in the still, dark house while we made ourselves comfortable on the huge bed. The hours crept by while we started to talk about things that happened in our lives, such as the passing of our grandmother and the rift that had grown in our family. I remember feeling happy in that moment. Finally, we were all talking again as we'd done all those years before. We felt like a family once more, happy and close like it always been when Granny was here. Dahlia even started crying, and we hugged her tightly. After this heartwarming conversation, we all grew silent. We were tired. Three hours had passed and nothing had happened yet. Azura was growing impatient and eventually grew tired of waiting. He got out of bed and returned to his own room, telling us we could contact him through the Nintendo chat if something was happening, but that he was not going to waste any more time waiting for nothing. We agreed and started the chat up, making sure our chat function was working. Another half hour passed and Peyton and Lori decided to go to bed too, only they didn't offer to stay in touch through the Nintendo. So it was only Jisoo, Dahlia, and I. We crawled underneath the blankets and began to draw things in the Nintendo chat box. We were having a great time while we were drawing and whispering to each other. We heard the church bell ring 1am. The loud sound of the single bell rang over the square and a sudden silence fell over the buildings. I even noticed I'd laid my Nintendo down and I was just holding my breath, listening. Suddenly, we heard the wooden floor above us squeak, as if someone was walking around in the attic. These footsteps sounded slow at first, which made me think it was just the house settling. But as we waited, the footsteps sounded quicker. Do you guys hear that? Jisoo asked softly, her voice startling me in the silence. Dahlia and I nodded, our faces only visible through the faint light the Nintendos were giving off. The footsteps continued, and suddenly we heard someone walking around down the stairs of the attic. The stairs were positioned on the other side of the door to the bedroom we were staying in. We held our breath as we listened. Then we could hear someone breathing, and it sounded like they were panting, as if in a panic. One of you sent Ezra a message, Jisoo said, and I started typing as fast as I could, but my hands were trembling, and I had trouble holding the pen in my hands. 
The footsteps and the breathing continued in the hallway, right in front of the door of the bedroom. Dahlia grasped for air when she heard the thing outside the door brush against the door, and Jisoo and I hurriedly covered her mouth. We need to hide. Came the soft, melodic voice from right outside the door, the voice of a young woman. She sounded panicked but there was a sweetness to her voice that made me forget my fear for a few seconds. But when the unseen person took another step, the fear and adrenaline came back. We should hide. The voice spoke louder this time. We heard a soft bump against the door as if someone placed their hand on it. I felt a cold wave of fear run down my spine I waited to hear the door finally open, but the sound never came. The footsteps became more distant, and we could hear someone walking towards the stairs that led to the hallway. Come on! Jisoo threw the blankets off and jumped out of the bed and towards the door of the bedroom. We should follow it. No! Dahlia exclaimed, her voice muted. She sounded like she was about to cry. We should stay here. Or wake our parents. It could be dangerous. Oh, come on, Dahlia. You always wanted to be a hero like Totally Spies, didn't you? This is your moment, said Jisoo. And those words did seem to encourage Dahlia. She stepped out of bed, hand in hand with me. Jisoo slowly opened the door, and we walked out of the room into the cold, empty hall. The only sources of light we had were the Nintendos in our hands, we could hear the footsteps downstairs and a soft sound that was like someone crying. This made the hairs on my arms rise. We snuck down the stairs, then came into another cold hallway. Hello? Jisoo asked out loud. The crying then stopped, but we could still hear that breathing. It was coming from the dining room. We held each other tightly as we walked towards the door of the dining room which we had left open. Suddenly, a dark figure ran past us, out of the dining room and into the kitchen. The sudden movement made us all jump, and Dahlia screamed loudly. We could hear a door being opened, and the footsteps continued into what surely must have been the wine cellar. Guys, I want to go back, Dahlia said, crying. But Jisoo and I continued walking, too intrigued to stop now. I dragged Dahlia with me while we stepped into the kitchen. The door to the wine cellar was open, and the piercing cold and earthy smell that came from the cellar filled our noses as we approached the door. Jisoo was the first to enter, holding her Nintendo with shaking hands in front of her to lighten our path. The dark was so dense that she tripped down the last two steps and slammed her face hard on the ground. As she fell, her Nintendo went flying through the cellar and came to a stop at the what should be a closed off door, but that door was open too. The lock was broken and dangling down on the door. Standing in the now open doorway was a young woman. She was dressed in a flowery, light blue dress, which reached past her knees and black shoes. She had blonde hair that was neatly tucked into a bun on the back of her head, her skin was as pale as freshly fallen snow. She looked at us with frightful eyes, and she opened her mouth, saying again, We should hide. She then turned and hurried down the long, dark tunnel. Dahlia and I quickly helped Jisoo up from the floor, and just as we began to turn towards the open door, all the lights in the house came on. Startled and blinded, by the sudden light, we screamed and turned around. Our parents stood there behind us with concerned looks on their faces. They asked what in the world was going on, and we told them everything. About the hole in the attic floor, the mysterious sounds, and the woman who led us here, and the open door into the tunnel. But when we turned to face the door in question, the door was closed, the lock was back on it, and there were no traces of that mysterious woman, only the Nintendo lying on the ground, broken. We were scolded for going into the wine cellar alone, and the rest of the week we were not allowed to be up too late. 
We also weren't allowed to go anywhere in the house without supervision. The rest of the trip was nice. Only every night around 1am we'd hear the whispers and the footsteps again, but we never went and followed the ghost like that one night. Who knows what would have happened to us, what we would have seen if we had followed her into that tunnel. Our parents never believed us, even when I recounted the story to them to this day. But I know what happened. I know what we saw. I remember all of what I am telling you. That villa was haunted. The Beast at the Window From Bill6928 This happened a very long time ago. I'm 54 years old right now. I was 28 when this happened. It began when I was driving home from the north part of my state, trying to get down south back to my family. A four to five hour drive really was taking it out of me, and I needed to catch up on some sleep. I pulled over onto the side of the road. I'd barely seen any cars and figured a few hours of sleep wouldn't do any harm. Soon, I found myself dozing off to the quietness in the truck. I woke up around 3 a.m. Something had been hitting something in the nearby forest. It sounded like someone beating a steel bat against a tree. It really put me on edge, because I'd never heard any animals do such a thing. I'd hunted many times and I'd seen many animals. I tried going back to sleep, eventually waking up again only around an hour later to find something had hit my car door. I'd felt the entire car shake and I nearly had a heart attack. Looking around to see what was there, I noticed foggy breathing, the type of thing that happens when it's cold and you can see your breath in the form of fog. This fog was rising every few seconds above my passenger window. It seemed as if someone, or something, was on the other side. Me being paranoid, I tried to lower myself down further into the seat. My body was now flattened on the seat, but I could see something looking in. I didn't know if it could see me, but it was drooling, whatever it was. What I was looking at appeared to be the head of a wolf. Its muzzle covered my window in a smudge of saliva. It pressed itself against the window hard. This animal was panting, as if it had run miles just to get to my car, and it appeared to be shaking, as if it was violently angry. Definitely not the scared kind of shaking, more the kind of I want to beat you to death shaking. I guess it hadn't seen me yet, because after long, it left. When it did, I got up, watched it walk into the woods, and became dumbfounded when I saw it walking on only two legs. These said legs were not the legs of a wolf nor a man. They were the legs of an elk or deer. Had it not been for the moonlight, I wouldn't have been able to see it at all. After the creature was gone, I sped off back home, shaking constantly the entire way. Back at home, I ran inside, locked the doors, and grabbed my 45 handgun, which was all I had at the time for protection. It's a very basic gun but it would keep me safe. I hunkered down for the night, keeping my gun close to me. The next morning, I went down to my car and saw a huge dent in the side of it, like that thing had thrown a bowling ball at it with full force. My car door was totaled, and I couldn't open it with the handle on the passenger side. I don't know what that was, but I've learned to never go down that road again. Why the House is Empty From Silver Bullet 54 There's an A-frame house that one of my mentors from college, named Bianca, used to live in. It was in a small community I'd lived in once. She lived there for about four years until she was scared out of the house one night in 2014, refusing to go back in. This was in a small gated community so I didn't understand why she was so freaked out. I thought it was because the front door is on the ground floor and easy to open, but it was what she had in the house that had terrified her. When she moved in, the house had been abandoned for a long time, 
littered with bat guano, mouse droppings, dead roaches, and extremely old newspapers. It was like somebody just upped and left with the new owner being the one to clean up. After a month's worth of deep cleaning, she got some furniture, a few appliances, and officially moved in. She said it was small, but cozy. One thing that did unnerve her was a decrepit old doghouse in the backyard of the property. I asked her why she was anxious about it, and she said she could never look at it when it was dark. She was always afraid when she looked at it, afraid that something would be looking back at her. I'd walked by that house day and night, and other than the empty feeling of the abandonment, nothing was exactly unnerving. One day I was with three of my friends, Jackie, Lexi, and Nathan, who were all college or high school age. Nathan asked if I knew the girl in the A-frame, and I told him I knew her from the college I had attended. He just nodded. I had a feeling he wanted to say something else. Jackie asked if she lived with an uncle or a father. When I told her no and asked why, she avoided my gaze but replied, I saw an old man in a plaid shirt staring at me one day from the second floor of that house. I smiled but he didn't smile back. Instead, he gave me a stern look. It was so severe, it was like he was staring a hole through me. Lexi said the same thing happened to her the previous week. Nathan finally said the other statement he hadn't mentioned, which was, anybody who lives in there is asking for trouble. Sometimes, I've heard growls emanating from that old doghouse. I thought the three of them were just being paranoid. On a cold October night in 2014, I was showing off my Halloween costume to the same three friends when we heard a hair-raising shriek. The next thing we knew, a Chevy roared down the road, probably doing at least 80. I recognized that Chevy as Bianca's. We all sprinted to the A-frame, but saw nothing out of the ordinary. Nathan shivered, then sprinted back to Jackie and Lexi's house. We caught up and asked him why he decided to cut and run like that. He said, Hell, hound, and left it at that. Bianca forced a few friends to go back to her house to pack things up. Nobody has lived there since then. I keep thinking about the place. I asked my dad and he said it's still empty, and that was eight years ago. What I want to know is what's keeping people away from it. Maybe it's the cost. Maybe it's the lack of cleanliness. Maybe the size. Or maybe it's a man in a plaid shirt and a terrifying mutt. I know I don't want to find out, as all answers would be scary on some level. Unknown Cryptid From Born to be Wild This incident happened back around 2015 or 2016. I just got out of a four and a half year long relationship with the girl I met online. During that relationship, I lived with her down in Connecticut, bordering Webster, Massachusetts. We were both very into the supernatural. After the breakup, I returned back to Seabrook, New Hampshire, where I grew up. I had no money and not much to save for belongings, but I knew lots of contractors and friends of the family that also owned paving companies, so there was no shortage of work. When I came back, I had no place to stay. So a friend of mine let me stay in his 30-foot luxury boat on his property. It had been tucked back into the surrounding woods, probably 20 feet or so from the grassy yard where it was propped up on stilts. So I had to use a 12-foot extension ladder to climb up onto the stern of the boat to get inside. I would do this every night and pull the ladder up behind me so nothing else could climb up in the middle of the night, which I often envisioned, because on many nights I would fall asleep listening to scary stories. One night, I'm returning home to the boat on a Saturday night. I just left one of my friend's parties. I had had a little bit to drink, so I had a nice buzz going. I'm not into any kind of substances, and I don't smoke up. Even just one hit gives me bad anxiety. So, like I said, all I'd had was some drinks. I was approaching the boat when I suddenly began to get that eerie feeling, the one we all try to brush off as nonsense, but nonetheless, I quickened my pace and got up the ladder as quickly as I could. As I climbed over the top of the ladder into the back of the boat, I began to hear footsteps racing towards the boat very quickly. So in response, I rapidly grabbed the ladder. I began to haul it up. 
When I got the ladder halfway, I began to push down on my end to teeter the other end up in the air to get it as high as possible. As I did this, something grabbed the lower end of the ladder and began to jerk it down, flinging my end of the ladder upward, smashing my funny bone. I roared out in pain. In the same instance, I smashed all my weight down on my end of the ladder as fast and hard as I could. Thankfully, maybe I just weighed more than whatever that thing was, because the ladder began to teeter in my favor. I peered at the other end of the ladder, and in the dim moonlight, I could see these long, skinny wrists and two little hands gripping the last rung on the ladder. The fingers were not long and pointy. Rather, they were short and stubby. The skin seemed to be a gray color, and its fingernails looked dirty. To be honest, they looked like they belonged to Gollum from Lord of the Rings. When the ladder was level with the boat, the creature let go, making me and the ladder smash down in the back of the boat. Immediately, I scrambled to my feet and ripped that ladder further up onto the boat, so nothing could jump up and grab it. I didn't have a flashlight handy, but I could see the figure peering up at me with milky gray eyes. I stumbled backwards away from the edge so I couldn't see it any longer. Then it began to run back and forth to and from the boat. It would get maybe 30 or 40 feet away, turn around, and run straight back at me. It began making a loud gurgling scream noise, mixed with a turkey it sounded like. That's the best way I can describe it. I didn't watch it run back and forth making the noise. I was too freaked out, so I stood watch and listened from the doorway entering the lower end side of the boat, getting ready to slam and lock the door at a moment's notice. This went on for about 15 minutes until it finally ran off further into the woods, and I never saw or heard it again. In my mind's eyes, it was running back and forth making that noise. I pictured it whipping its head back and forth while it did, which to me would have been a ridiculous sight so it made me laugh. I've been waiting to tell that story for a while. I'm glad I'm finally doing this. I'm not the kind of person that is afraid to tell their stories. I literally tell anyone that will listen, especially when the subject of the supernatural comes up. I hope you enjoyed. And remember, no noise happens for no reason. Superstition or Reality From Returner 0173 I had recently turned 28 years old and felt a sudden urge to look back on my life. There are people, friends, and teachers I wanted to see again. At least, it felt like that. But oddly enough, I don't remember their full names or their faces. Instead, I decided to look up family I hadn't seen in a long time, since immigrating to the United States. That's when I started to feel unease as certain memories flooded back. My dad's family immigrated to the US a long time ago, which leaves my mother's side back in the Philippines. When I was younger, I would visit them during times when school was out of session. They live on the northern part of the archipelago in a very rural area called Agoo La Union. The area is surrounded by rice paddies and tree lines that housed fish ponds that also transitioned to more rice paddies and the home itself is two hours away by foot from the beach, if you cut through the rice paddies. The exact memories causing me unease occurred during the only and last full year I'd spent there. It was right before our family immigrated to the US. Due to how the school system worked, despite having completed more advanced subjects, the K-12 through system in the US would force me a year back, so the family decided I would go ahead and spend a full year with my mother's family in La Union while they finalized the paperwork and while my mother settled things with her company. All my other visits prior to this had been great. The Spanish colonial style of home was made almost entirely out of some red-colored hardwood, and the furniture looked as though it had been made specifically to match the house. It felt scenic and more relaxing than the modern city life I'd been accustomed to. That made me curious. However, my grandparents and the family that lived there had one rule. Do not try to open a specific room on the second floor, and if you somehow find it open, do not remove the cover of the mirror inside. I never questioned this rule before, but this time around I had a full year, and I was 10 years old. 
I spent about six months, curious but no unusual goings on. When I would pass that room, I would end up staring at the door. I'd ask my grandparents about it, but they'd just smile at me and tell me to ignore it. My grandparents are a mix of Spanish, Japanese, and Filipino. I shrugged the rules off as just superstition. The rest of the family told me to ignore it as well, but emphasized to avoid the room. Three months before our flight to the United States, things would begin to change. One July afternoon, I had spent the day with the local kids climbing trees and getting bit by large red ants while trying to get at the sweet fruits called duat, or java plums, since everyone else was away doing errands and business. I believe it was around 4 p.m., or maybe 5 p.m., that I went back to the house as my grandparents and cousins were coming home. I ran upstairs to grab a change of clothes and a towel, since I spent most of the day sweaty and dirty. I turned right at the top of the stairs to go to this open area. It's kind of like another living room. There are sofas lining the three walls, and the windows right by them were open. I don't remember opening them myself before I left the house to play. There were two doors in there, too. If you continue straight from the doorway after turning right from the top of the stairs, those doors would be to your left. The farthest door from the stairs is a room where I kept my clothes. The closer door to the stairs is the one we're supposed to keep locked. Well, when I went through the doorway, that door was wide open. It was the smallest room I've ever seen. It's almost like a closet, maybe slightly wider to fit a twin XL bed on the left side, but there wasn't anything in that room except at the very back was a mirror. I'm 5'11 right now, and that thing would have been at least 6'4", with the wooden frame and all. The mirror itself was shaped like an oval, but at this moment I didn't know that because there was a thick white cloth covering the whole thing. I felt drawn to it, but I remembered that I was not supposed to go in there. The longer I stared, the more unease I felt. I told myself to see if there was anyone else home, but my body wouldn't move. I was standing a few feet away from the entrance of that room, but my mind was racing. I knew I hadn't seen anyone on my way to the house and on my way up. I had to be alone. The more I realized this, the more the hair on the back of my neck stood up. Suddenly, I felt something grab onto my arm. I yelled, freaking out. But it was my grandmother, looking at me scared and worried. I think I may have seen some anger in her expression too. She moved her body so that the view of the mirror was obscured, and she asked me in a very stern voice, Did you look into the mirror? I looked around a bit confused. It was already dark out, but I had only come up here a few minutes ago, when there was still light out. I told her I, I don't know, that I had just got back in from playing outside. As she escorted me downstairs, she apologized that they came home a bit late, because the place that hauls the rice we harvest had a problem. When I looked at the clock downstairs, it was nearly 8pm. Where had the time gone? I think she may have told my grandfather and my cousins, because they all went up together while I was eating dinner. I didn't do anything after that as I was still confused. By the time I went to bed, it was around 12pm. When I went back upstairs, that door was closed again. They'd attached something by the doorknob, and a chain was looped through it. This was to prevent the door from swinging inward and opening. That confused me even more, since that still meant someone from the outside could just undo the chains if they wanted to. But I guess they didn't think I was the one who opened the door in the first place. Aside from my grandparents' room and the room I keep my clothes in, which only had one bed for my female cousin, the rest of us slept on bamboo mats with a futon on top that we roll out on the floor of the living room-like area upstairs. There are four of us, ranging from 10 to 15 years old, and I was the youngest. My mind was occupied that night, and unable to sleep until sunrise, I only slept like an hour or two at that point before my cousins woke me up for good. But nothing creepy had occurred. For an entire week, it was peaceful, and I'd forgotten all about it. Then things picked up. Exactly a week later, during an event just after dinner, we were watching a show while relaxing, and I had to use the bathroom. The problem was that the house itself had no bathroom built in it. The house had a gazebo or an extended roof to the side, 
In a way, the front door is a side door, since the front that faces the gate and the road to enter the property has no door, just windows. Once you exit the front door, you turn left for a few feet and right next to the house is a cemented staircase leading up to a door. This is where the toilet was. The height is about midway between the second and first floor. It's like walking up to a throne, which I always enjoyed as a kid. Above the toilet on the wall is a rectangular hole that opens to the backyard, where there was a large mango tree. Beyond that, it opens to a field of rice paddies. While I was on the toilet, I felt a chill. There was something primal inside me that made me sweat, despite the night being cold. That feeling of being watched coming from all over was prickling at my senses. I knew there was no way this was possible, as there's only one opening and it was right above me. I tried my best to act like nothing was happening, telling myself not to turn around or look up. I sat there, my nerves causing my body to shiver. I heard a sound that forced me to bite my lip until it bled to stop myself from screaming. This sound was unmistakably like someone's tongue clicking, and it sounded deliberate. Each sound clicked in threes, separated by two seconds apart, and they grew harder each time. I was trying to finish as fast as I could, pushing the bidet multiple times. When I was finally completely done, I ran out as fast as I could. I'd forgotten to pull my pants up too. It was a miracle I didn't trip. My eldest male cousin, Eugene, looked at me worried. Everyone had gone up to bed while I was in the toilet. Apparently, I'd been taking too long. He was asked to wait for me downstairs. I couldn't explain it to him, but it must have spooked him because he looked out the windows before shutting them. The windows there were made of small rectangular sheets that are lined up horizontally, like those horizontal blinds, and they close much in the same way. He urged me upstairs after shutting them and did the same to the windows up there before we lay down to sleep. I don't know what time it was, but it was extremely dark. I woke up from this sound, like creaking. I was the second to the last spot closest to the doorway that leads to the stairs. Eugene was the last. I could tell the creaking was coming from the door because in the entire darkness, a light was coming off from there, and it grew more and more before the creaking transitioned to the floorboards. I felt a pinch on my arm then. It was Eugene facing me. I could barely see his face in the dark, but the moonlight coming through the now-opened room made some of his features more visible. He looked afraid. His head shook side to side as though telling me not to look. He didn't speak but the finger on his lips told me not to make a sound. He closed his eyes for several seconds, then opened them, telling me to do the same by nodding. No words were exchanged, but the way his eyes widened when the creak of the floorboard sounded louder and closer made it obvious. I began to sweat, my chest heaving, but I forced myself not to make a sound, and I closed my eyes tightly. The creak continued moving around the room, Eugene held my arm tightly to make sure I was still there, since he had closed his eyes as well. I kept mine closed, but the anxiety of hearing the creaking sounds moving closer made me tense up. My eyelids were beginning to hurt. I do not know how long it took. It felt eternal. There were no footsteps on the floors each time it creaked, but sometime later, clear taps, almost like a footstep but distorted, came from the ceiling replacing the creaking on the floorboard. A loud metallic creak filled the room coming from the farthest wall. My eyes were closed, but my back was pointing against the source of the metallic creak. The cool breeze let me know that the window had been opened. The taps on the ceiling were right above me. Eugene's hand tightened even more, and I got a feeling that my other cousins were also awake now. They were normally messy sleepers, but they were dead steady. The footsteps on the ceiling stopped right above me, but I could feel that if I opened my eyes, something would be staring right at me, and it made me want to scream. I could feel the breeze from the now open window against my back, and there was a cold brush against my cheek. Then the... The tongue clicks returned, and they were loud, as though whoever or whatever was making them knew we were awake. It came from behind me, 
and the sound of something hollow tapping on the glass pane came too. As I mentioned, the walls were lined with the sofa, so right by our head a sofa separated us from the wall. The two windows lining that wall right above us creaked. The smell of tobacco hit my nose, followed by sulfur and ammonia. From that same window, I could hear heavy breathing each time the tobacco smell surged. The leaves of the mango tree by that window shook like something was moving the branches. The tongue clicks behind me, the tobacco, ammonia, sulfur smells, and heavy breathing right by my head seemed to go on forever. I was not in the right mind to keep track of time, but I know for sure that it would be a while before the floorboard creaked again. I heard cackling from both directions out the window, then felt an unmistakable cold hand grasping my right ankle. Eugene squeezed my arm then. I guess he could feel me become more tense, and I tried to remain calm, but I soiled myself then. After that, I'm not sure what happened. I know that I spent the entire night awake. When the neighbor's chickens crowed, Eugene set up, followed by the rest of my cousins. They were all drenched in sweat, and so was I. Being boys, they would have surely made fun of me for soiling myself, but they didn't. It was still just before sunrise, but there was enough light for us to move around now. We turned on the lights and ran downstairs as a group, all scared but relieved. The locked room was wide open, and the mirror had no covers on it. When I came around to look sometime later that day, the window panes had scratch marks that weren't there before. The ceiling had scratch marks on it too. My uncle and Eugene were trying to fix the door. Apparently the knob had been completely wrecked, so I was able to see inside while they were trying to fix it. The floor by the mirror, when I first looked in the room, there weren't any scratch marks, but now that floor was covered in them. This experience would continue on, deferring intensity for the rest of the time I was there, especially the feeling of being watched. It stopped feeling like that for a long while, since moving to the US, until I remembered it all recently. Since then, I feel creeped out at night, especially when there's a large mirror and an open window. But it's summer here now, and it feels extremely hot. Now and again, dreams that feel too real about something coming out of a mirror when I'm alone plagues me. I don't know anymore. Is it just suggestive superstition, or was it all real? Something Stared Back From Season This isn't a particularly eventful story, but it is true and still gives me the creeps to this day. I've always loved the water, the ocean in particular. Even after some of the strange and creepy things I've encountered, it still holds a special place in my heart. When I was around 15, my mom and I took a cruise down through the Caribbean, stopping at all the well-known destinations along the coast of Mexico and some of the smaller Central American countries. Our last stop before heading back to port was a tiny island off the coast of Honduras. We had decided to book what was supposed to be a relaxing snorkeling excursion. Sure, it wasn't the most famous for underwater activities, but there are some absolutely gorgeous reefs in the area, and I wanted to be a marine biologist at the time, so it was like heaven for me. We took a small ferry out from the main port to the island we would be spending the day on, and after lunch, I was straight off to the water. I remember it was strange that day. It was beautiful out, sure, but there was almost no one else in that water. I think there was only one other person when I first got in, and I seem to remember noticing they'd left at some point while I was out, leaving the reef all to myself. Nonetheless, the water was like a dream. Not too hot, not too cold, tall shelves of reddish coral swarming with tropical fish. I don't know how long I spent just floating around, but it must have been hours. I at least know I came out looking like a freshly cooked lobster by the end. Anyway, I was floating on my stomach, facing directly below me, 
trying to identify any of the fish I could see, meaning I wasn't paying attention to where I was going. Suddenly, like someone had flipped a switch, the water got cold, and in the same instant, I found I had kicked my way over the drop-off point. The reef ended, and I could see the rocky outcrop sliding down, down into the nothingness below me. This may not seem scary to those who have not experienced it, or anything like it, but suddenly finding yourself suspended above a seemingly bottomless void, it causes a kind of primal terror in you. I froze up, suddenly feeling incredibly small, out of place. The silence of the water in my ears was deafening. As I stared down into the abyss, I felt a strong sense of vertigo. And just as I was regaining my senses and the ability to move, I saw it. Something shifted in the murky darkness below me. Something big, impossibly big. The last thing I remember seeing was a massive eye opening up, looking directly at me. Then the next thing I knew, I was back on shore trying desperately to explain what had happened to my probably tipsy mom. When I got to the part about seeing something in the water below me, my voice caught. I could tell she was only half listening as it was, and I didn't want to make myself sound crazy by reporting some giant sea creature only a few hundred feet out. I never told anyone that part of my story, and to this day, I still wonder what it was I could have seen. Maybe it was some whale or other large creature that had drifted closer than usual to the shore. I know it's a cliché, but I know it wasn't my mind playing tricks on me. Whatever it was, I was never able to bring myself to look over the deck of the ship at night, too scared I'd see something watching me from the darkness again. Warning. The following story contains depictions of badly injured animals. Can Bigfoot get chronic wasting disease? From Ghost Mooner. I used to be a game warden for a certain state that I don't want to name here. I've seen a lot of weird stuff in my eight years there, before I got injured in a gunfight with a drunk poacher. One of the stranger things I've ever seen while I was employed was something I saw walking past my vicinity one early autumn afternoon. Dispatch got a call about a person shooting at some deer right outside of someone's home from the street, and that the person shooting was shooting from inside a blue truck parked on the shoulder of the road, which is very illegal. So I headed over to the location and met up with another game warden. We start investigating the site. The shooting happened right on the shoulder next to a large house with a rather large lawn on the side of it that merged right into a thick woodland area. My coworker and I found a 30 6 brass shell casing in the dirt on the shoulder, and it was still warm, confirming the call. While my partner interviewed the eyewitness who heard the shot and peeked out the window in time to see the blue truck drive off, I searched the area for any possible bullet impacts or even blood drops from a wounded animal. I eventually made my way to the tree line, where I happened to luck out and find a fresh impact spot on a tree. I took stills of it with my phone. Then I noticed there was a bit of blood on the ground off to the side. I followed it into the woods. The land flowed up onto a steep but short ridge covered in trees, and beyond was some type of narrow gully that looks like it floods during heavy rains. I stopped on top of this ridge line and looked around. Having lost the sparse blood trail, I scanned my surroundings slowly. That was about the time I started hearing something moving through the forest. It was coming from up the gully on my right, but out of sight because of all the trees. I thought it was the wounded deer, and I was about to step forward to get sight of it, but then I began smelling something awful. It was a faint smell of rotting meat and other smells that I won't mention, because if you've been around dead bodies before, you'll understand that it's not just the decomp of the flesh that stinks, but what they eat or drink that also blends with it. What's worse is that it was getting stronger, and so was the noise. It sounded like something casually passing through thick bushes, 
and dragging their feet across the ground. Whatever it was, it was not trying to be sneaky. I was just about to call out, Game Warden, to see if it was a person, but then I caught sight of something in the narrow spaces of the tree trunks. A flash of something dark brown, or mottled dark and brown, I don't know. But for some reason, it made me freeze in place. It slowly seemed to meander closer, following the natural openness of the bushy gully. The smell was much stronger now, and I had to breathe more through my mouth, and I could make a little more detail through the trees now. I saw flashes of hair or fur, but it was complex, and the moments I could see it between the trees were too short to absorb or process much detail. Eventually, it was at my two o'clock, and the trees were less dense now. As it visually passed in between them, I could make out more and more of what this thing was. It was large, very large. I want to say eight feet tall and very wide in the shoulders. It was covered from head to toe in dark brown hair, but there was more to its appearance. The face looked like a caveman if he didn't shave, and it had black leathery skin. One eye was missing while the other was very foggy white. The mouth was agape, and it looked like it was missing some of its lower lip. The torso was patchy with large, deep gashes with gray muscle tissue inside. But the worst part was that its abdomen was mostly missing, and what intestines remained were dangling off its right hip. Its left thigh had a huge part missing on the outside, and its right foot was just gone. It was stepping on its own ankle stump. I was frozen. I don't think I even breathed, for the whole time it sort of lazily meandered past in front of me down the gully. After a while, I could no longer see it, and the smell was fading. So I carefully turned around, and as quietly as I could, I trekked back to my partner, who was extracting the bullet from the tree I found. He could tell I saw something weird, because of the look on my face. He just nodded and said, Had a jump out in the woods? which is our local lingo for, he saw something weird out there, huh? I nodded back, and I headed to my patrol truck, downing a whole bottle of water I had in a cooler. To this day, I have no clue where it was going, where it came from, how it got that way. I can only truly hope that it's an extremely rare phenomenon, and we all won't have to worry about it on a bigger scale. There is a type of disease out there that affects deer, elk, and even moose called CWD, or chronic wasting disease. It's very nasty, and I've had to put down deer who had it. But whatever this Bigfoot, Sasquatch, or whatever the heck it was, had, that wasn't it. This creature was very dead. Its flesh and soft tissue was gray-toned. To me, it was more like a zombie Bigfoot. The Ghost on I-4 From TE-74 This happened to me about 23 years ago in Plant City, Florida. I was going through a rough time as I'd broken up with my fiancé for cheating on me, and I'd moved in with my sister, her husband, and their three kids. I got a dishwashing job at a restaurant, and I moved up quickly to midday prep and dishwasher. I was making good money, about 13 bucks an hour, which was great money for that time. Since my bad breakup with my ex fiance I decided that I wanted an entry-level sports car. So I went to a local Mitsubishi dealer and got a 1993 3000 GT with low miles. This was a bit before the Fast and Furious, but needless to say, I'd put a couple of thousand dollars into the wheels, speaker system, and engine. I could easily do 130 miles per hour quickly when I needed to. I managed to make a few friends at work, and we'd pile into my 3000 GT, going to the local party district to go clubbing. It was a Friday night at about 12.30am. We all headed to a local party district to club called The Machine. We got to the club around 1am. I had a few crown and cokes. After about an hour and a half of me striking out, trying to talk up a few women, I told the guys I was bored and a little tired, so I was going home. Oddly enough, all four co-workers had no problem with me leaving, so I asked the bartender for a Red Bull and a cup of Fountain Coke. 
I quickly downed them both, then walked over to my 3000 GT in the parking tower. Fully awake now, I settled into my leather racing front bucket seat, turned the key, and my engine gurgled through the large racing dual exhaust system. I turned on my lights, shoved my stick shift into reverse, and soon I was blasting nine-inch nails while sitting at a red light before the interstate. Then an SUV with three very attractive girls pulled up next to me. This got my attention. The brunette, who was probably a Latina and looked like a model, blew me a kiss and handed me her phone number through our open windows on a piece of a napkin. Maybe the night wasn't a waste after all, I thought. I quickly pulled over at a McDonald's and called the number on the napkin. The phone rang for about six times and I almost hung up, but a female answered laughing and giggling finally. That was quick she said. I laughed and agreed. I told her my name and she gave me hers, which was Zelda. We talked about 15 minutes. She said to call her back later around noon. I was pretty happy now as I hung up the phone and decided the night went pretty well. I threw my phone into the bucket seat beside me and I turned up my system to keep me focused while driving. Quickly, I pulled onto the interstate and shifted the clutch into fifth gear. I was now cruising at about 85 miles per hour. My sister's place was about an hour's drive from the club, so I usually drove fast to get home, because I don't like coming home too late. I tended to wake up the kids and tee off my sister and her husband. Looking down at my watch, it read 3.10 a.m. I quickly looked back up at the interstate, trying to stay more focused. There were few cars on the interstate at this time, and that was fine by me as I could drive fast without having to worry about crashing into another car. Finally, I got to my favorite song on the CD and began drumming on the steering wheel. I looked back out onto the interstate and noticed the light poles became more spread out and the woods were blurring by on both sides of the car. For reasons I still can't explain, my CD player skipped, causing my attention to focus on the car deck briefly and then back up as I drove under an overpass. My eyes widened with terror as my eyes fell on this disheveled-looking old man standing in the middle of the interstate, staring at me. Now, you should understand I was driving at 85 miles per hour, and although I had sport car quality brakes, there was no way I could have stopped before hitting him. I locked up my brakes and my tires squealed ear-piercingly loud. Thick white smoke began to encircle my car. My hands were locked on the steering wheel, shaking. My eyes were locked on the spot where the old man had been, and my breathing was out of control. I peeled myself out of my car, and I began to look for the old man with my flashlight. I was sure that I'd hit him, that I'd killed this man. My mind was racing, my body still shivering. I continued to search for him, but I realized I'd better pull my car under the overpass so I didn't cause another accident. After a few more minutes of searching the area and the overpass itself, something dawned on me. I hadn't heard any smashing metal sounds. I hadn't seen any broken glass from my car. Certainly hitting someone going that fast, my car would be a wreck. In my panic, I'd forgotten all about actually checking my car. I jogged fast back over to the front of my 3000 GT and began surveying the front of the car. Nothing. No blood, no damage. Just nothing. It was now 3.33 a.m. as I checked my watch. An odd thing I noticed as well was that during all this time no other vehicles passed my way, either from my side or the other side of the interstate. I got back into my car, now wondering what had just happened. Did I see a road apparition? Since there was no blood or damage to my car, I didn't call the highway troopers as I didn't want to answer a bunch of questions about making a prank call. I shut my door, turned the key, and prepared to get back on the road again. As I began to pull out of the overpass, my headlights shone on the apparition again. It was him. He had this sad, lost look in his eyes. He was wearing a bucket hat, a white polo shirt, brown pants, and black slip-on shoes. He was waving at me, as if to say, It's okay. Come on. It's safe to go out on the interstate. I was so scared 
that my foot instinctively began to press on the gas from sheer horror. However, before I floored it, I gazed quickly out of my driver's side mirror and stomped hard on the brakes. No sooner had I stopped when all of a sudden, almost out of nowhere, a speeding 18-wheeler flew by me and laid down on the loud truck horn as he did. My heart stopped and I was frozen in place with terror. The 18-wheeler's red taillights faded fast over the hill in front of me. I got the courage to look back across the interstate overpass, searching for that old man. There was nothing now. Just an overpass, interstate pole light, and my car. I gathered my courage together and got back on the interstate safely, driving home and actually obeying the speed limit this time. It was 4.30 a.m. when I pulled into the driveway at my sister's. It was too late to go inside now as I would definitely wake up the house. So I just turned everything off in my car, curled up, and went to sleep right there. The next thing I woke to was my sister knocking on my window telling me to pull my car out so her husband can get out. I groggily did, then walked like a zombie back into the house. She made some coffee and asked why I got back so late. I told her that she probably wouldn't believe me. She gave me the look, so I told her everything. My sister was a nurse in the local hospital ER, and she worked six nights on, three days off, 12-hour shifts. As I told her my story, she began to get whiter in her face, drinking less of her coffee. She waited until I finished and told me something chilling. A week ago, on her last night before her three days off, the paramedics brought in an elderly man suffering from Alzheimer's. He had wandered from his home that night and got hit by a car on the interstate. She said the paramedics told her that they picked him up at a certain mile marker. He got hit under overpass 333 on the interstate. That was the exact overpass that I'd seen the ghost at, and my watch had also read 3.33 a.m. She said he was pretty smashed up and died within a few hours. Just before he died, though, she said the oddest thing. She went back into his room to check on him, and he was awake. He had the saddest eyes, and he was waving at her to come over to him, she thought. But when she got there, his eyes were closed again, and he was unconscious. We both grabbed each other's hands and prayed at that moment. Shortly thereafter, I paid my car off, traded it in, and got an F-150. I met my future wife a few weeks later, and the rest is history, as they say. Looking back, though, had I not looked out my mirror before I jutted out onto the interstate that dark, lonely morning, I wonder if I would have been the next one, beckoning sadly to unsuspecting drivers, luring them to their doom under that overpass. Terrifying Encounter in Small Town, Ohio From Sindelina Back in the 80s, my dad had a friend named Joe who worked for the Ohio Parks and Wildlife Division. He normally worked in the Columbus area. However, on this occasion, he was in a town called Defiance, where the Independence Dam State Park is located. Joe described the park as being well hidden, nestled between a wide river and a thick forest of tall trees. Once inside, it was long and narrow with a small camping area in the back. One way in, one way out, and nothing but dense, deep forest behind it. This is his story. Joe met with the sheriff, David, I believe, at his office. The day was pretty much uneventful until around 9 p.m. when a call came in requesting the sheriff and Joe respond to a couple camping out at the dam. After about a 15-minute drive through the park, they arrived at the very last campsite where an older silver RV sat. A couple in their mid to late 40s was standing outside waiting. The sheriff addressed the couple while Joe began looking around. The first thing he noticed was how everything had been thrown about. Lawn chairs upside down or broken, a smashed up picnic table, a heavy duty grill that was cemented into a concrete slab had been bent in half. The couple said they had arrived earlier in the day to get everything set up ready for a relaxing weekend of camping. 
They decided to catch some fresh fish for dinner, and that's when they said they felt as if they were being watched. A heavy uneasiness came over them as they realized the nature around them had gone silent. No birds singing, crickets chirping, nothing. They chose to play it safe and return empty-handed. The couple came back to their RV and began to make a different dinner for the evening, when suddenly the RV began to violently shake back and forth, knocking them both to the floor. To them, it sounded as if they were surrounded on each side of the RV. However, they heard and saw nothing. After several minutes of being tossed about like rag dolls, the husband shouted that he had a gun. The rocking stopped abruptly and was followed by a long, low bellow, which they could feel vibrating beneath their feet. Keep in mind, this was the 80s, so there weren't any cell phones they could use to call for help. They waited a while before grabbing their gun, throwing the RV door open, and booking it to their truck. There, they drove to a payphone and called for help. The sheriff reassured the couple, telling them they would check out the area and find the people responsible. Joe said he never forgot what the lady said next. You aren't looking for people, Sheriff. You're looking for monsters. David went back to his vehicle, grabbed a shotgun, tossed a flashlight to Joe, and they headed out into the woods. Joe wasn't for a moment thinking anything other than this being a bunch of teenagers, but he did notice a look of concern on David's face. The deeper they went, the darker it got. It became so dark that Joe could only see maybe a couple of feet in front of him. At one point, he realized that David had stopped walking. When he turned to say something to him, he was met with a quick, Hush. He watched David point his finger towards the darkness. Joe shined his flashlight where he was pointing, which was about 15 feet away or so. The area was thick with tall, wide trees packed tightly together. Between the trees, David whispered. Joe began moving the flashlight slowly up, then down, when he saw something. Pressed up against a tree was a leg, a man's leg, but larger and hairier. He then saw a long, godly shaped hand, which reminded him of what a man's hand might look like if it had been broken and never healed properly. It had claws instead of nails, which were long, sharp, and wide. Joe felt his heart drop into his stomach as his legs weakened. Then he felt it, the vibration beneath his feet the couple had described, followed by long, deep growls. The air became filled with a suffocating, pungent odor, causing both men to recoil in disgust. Joe moved the flashlight up a good eight feet off the ground. There he saw a face. It was covered in thick, brownish-gray hair and had the muzzle and teeth of a large canine. The eyes looked like two dancing orange flames, and they were looking right at them. Shoot it. Joe whispered to David. As soon as those words left his mouth, several of the same type of creature began slowly creeping out from behind the trees. We have to get out of here, David said softly while slowly walking backwards. Joe was the most terrified he'd ever been in his life, and he could not get his legs to move. He couldn't see them, but he could feel them moving in closer and closer with every passing second. The vibrations had become painful by this point, feeling as if his spine was getting ready to explode. Joe admitted to us that he thought those would be his last moments on Earth, viciously mauled by some unknown predators. When, suddenly, a bright flash of light lit the night sky and a loud bang accompanied it. Horrific screams filled the air, and Joe ran for his life. Later on, Joe found out that David had saw movement behind him. He fired his shotgun in the direction, hoping to scare whatever those things were off. Eventually, they made it back to the campers. Both men were black and blue, with scratches from head to toe from running blind, 
and the sheriff made them vacate the area immediately. The park was closed for a few weeks after that incident, telling the public it was for repairs. Before Joe left to come back home, he asked the sheriff what he thought it was they saw that night. Without hesitation, he said, Werewolf. He then went on to tell him about the Defiance werewolf spotted back in the 70s. Apparently, a railway worker had an encounter with one, which had been stalking the tracks late one night. Even many, many years later, Joe says it's one of his most vivid memories. He'll never understand what they were exactly, or what caused those crazy vibrations, but he does know that they're real, and he'll never return to that part of Ohio again. The Black-Eyed Girl From Anonymous At the time of writing this, it was last week that I had a very strange encounter with the BEC, or Black-Eyed Children. It was super creepy to say the least. I lost sleep over it. Now, I may get scared easily, but this was the first time I felt actual fear for my life. I live on a dirt road with not too many houses nearby. I only have a few neighbors, and one of them has kids. It's a really quiet place for the most part, and I used to like that, but ever since this incident occurred, I've been more paranoid than I usually am. It began on one April night. It was pretty warm for a night in the beginning week of April. I live in the south, so it's nothing new. Anyway, it was around 12.40 a.m., and I'm awake, just checking out my YouTube page and watching random stuff. Out of nowhere, I hear my big dog, Bella, beginning to growl at the front door. I have two dogs, three indoor cats, and one outdoor cat. And if you ask me, animals seem to be more sensitive to paranormal stuff than humans are. Anyway, Bella's growling was really unusual. She's a very friendly lab mix and never growls. So I look up from my computer and I could have sworn I saw something through the glass border around my front door. I tried to tell Bella to hush, since the walls were paper thin, and if she started barking, she'd easily wake the rest of my family. Luckily, Bella did calm down when she heard my voice, but she stayed put at the front door anyway. I thought everything was okay after that, but 10 minutes later, not only was Bella growling again, but my cats were all staring at the front door not blinking for even a second. It's like they were seeing something that I could not see. This time, I got up from my bed, as my bed is in the living room for past medical reasons, and as I took a couple of steps to the door, I heard a light knocking sound. Bella started growling a little louder at this point, and I immediately felt on edge. There was something or someone on the other side of that door. At first, I thought it was a burglar, but our doors are always unlocked, and if that were the case, they would just barge in immediately. I cautiously took a few more steps, and I stood beside Bella. I looked outside, and I saw what looked to be an eight-year-old little girl. She was really pale and wore something that looked to be a 1950s school uniform. But that wasn't the scariest part about her. When I looked closer at her face, her eyes were black, Every single bit of her eyes, solid black. I felt my heart beginning to pound faster as she knocked again. Since there are two doors at the front entrance, I opened the inside door and asked her what she was doing out so late. She didn't answer me, but instead asked me if she could come in. What scared me was the way she asked it. There was a level of confidence in her tone that shouldn't have been there. Normally, if you're a kid, late at night, wanting help, you'd be nervous, you'd be scared, and that would be reflected in your tone of voice. But this girl spoke with confidence. I just stared at her for a few seconds before she asked again. This time, she said my first name, along with her question. I immediately locked the outside door and shut the inside door, locking it too before going to the door that led to the garage. As I was about to lock it, I heard her voice coming from the outside of the garage. She said, Please let me in, miss. I won't hurt you. 
This scared the crap out of me so much that I froze. After a minute, which seemed like hours, I snapped out of my trance and locked the garage door. I then ran back to my bed, pulling the covers over myself like a frightened child. Still, I could hear her knocking every five seconds, asking to be let in. My cats were going nuts at this point, hissing at the doors. Bella was growling louder too. The animal's growling must have scared this little girl away, because I no longer heard her knocking anymore. Naturally, I didn't sleep at all that night, and I couldn't sleep much for the next few days either, only falling asleep for an hour before waking up in a panic. Whenever I did fall asleep for that one hour, I swear I could hear her voice calling my name, and I could see those black eyes of hers. It's been a week since this happened, and I haven't seen or heard from this strange girl again. I've read stories and knew enough to never let these children into your home. I'm glad I didn't. I have a feeling that if I did, I'd be locked in a mental hospital from going insane. Or worse. There are monsters in Yosemite National Park. From Adam. There were fires in Yosemite National Park here in California on June 26, 2022. They were the Washburn fires that spread quickly. These fires revealed something that science cannot explain. I am a firefighter, and during the fires earlier this year in California, a lot of rescue crews were called to help. I swear on everything I hold dear to me that there has to be some sort of monster or monsters in that national park. Myself and three other firefighters saw something that changed our lives. Two days before we got sent to deal with the Washburn forest fires, our captain told us that they needed volunteers and that our department was able to send four of us. That would be me, J, E, and S. I went home and told my wife what was going on, that I had to leave to help out with the Washburn fires. At 3.30 a.m. on June 26th, I was awakened by a call from S. Yeah, what is it? I said. S replied, Hey Adam, I know it's early, but we've been asked to come leave ASAP. Seems the fire is spreading pretty fast, and the crews there need help towards the northern side of the fire. I told him I'd meet him at E's place. He said he'd already called J, that J was already on his way to my house. I got up and told my wife what's going on. She didn't say anything, she just looked at me, concerned. Finally, after about a minute of silence, she said, I love you, please be careful. I replied, I love you too, don't worry, I'm gonna be fine. I truly believed that. Being a firefighter for almost six years, I learned a thing or two. I got ready and set my bag by the door. I started to make myself a cup of coffee when my phone notification went off. It was Jay. Said he'd be pulling up in a minute. I looked out the kitchen window and I saw Jay pulling up in the front yard. I met him at the door and invited him inside, asking if he'd like a cup of coffee, but he declined, saying he had some in the truck as well as several packs of Red Bull. We set off then, meeting at E's place, where we loaded up into two trucks packed with all of our gear. Living in California, if you don't know, it's hot during the summer and at that time in the morning it was about 77 degrees, but during the day, away from the fire, it was about 103. We drove for two hours, and by then we got pretty close to base camp when we saw some animals running away from the fires off to the side of the road. E said over the radio from the other truck that we needed to slow down to avoid hitting any deer or something else. Jay responded, You're only cautious because you don't have insurance. We laughed and carried on more cautiously. By the time we made it to base camp, we could see the hillside glowing in the distance. We saw rescue crews pulled over on the side of the road. We stopped and asked about the situation. One of them said he had to pull the camp farther back due to how much smoke was coming through. Crews were coming down there, setting up a new camp here. We put the hazard lights on, pulling off next to the other unit. A few minutes later, about 18 more units showed up. That's a lot of people trying to get control over this blaze. 
which was now quite close to a small town and some homes. Another two units kept going past us. The captain commented that the campers who had been found were alive, but they had inhaled a lot of smoke and were suffering from dehydration. One of them had mild burns. We got geared up, checked our masks and tanks, got our axes ready, and were given a starting position. Now, controlling the spread of fires and keeping a lookout for all of your men and other people is trouble. Fighting this blaze went on for weeks, rotating crews and six-hour shifts. This fire was massive when we got there in the beginning, and it was only about 20% contained. We got a call that one of the civilians at the Southgate Brewing Company reported that they had a younger brother, who had not been heard from in a couple of hours, that he was supposed to be back at his cabin. Our unit was the closest to it, so we went to check it out. That call came on July 2nd. S and I had gotten our things ready, and he was almost done sharpening our axes since we have to keep them well maintained in these situations. Jay was getting the location of the cabin while he and the captain marked a route, trying to figure out the best way possible at the moment. We left about half an hour later. We took the ATVs that were available to use, and we made our way to the location of the cabin. On the way there, we saw other crews working and the sound of helicopters overhead. An hour into our search and rescue, we found the cabin covered with fire retardant from helicopters flying above. Even so, it had some fire damage. E notified base camp that we found the cabin and gave them a description. Over our radios, we heard base camp give us the okay to search, but to be cautious of the structure, they let us know that another unit was heading our way to provide support. J and S checked the sides to make sure we could enter, but E already went in like an idiot. Worried about E, I followed him instead of waiting. We went inside. It was smoky still, but what was much worse was the body we found. It was burned, but it looked like it had been torn into first. We stood there horrified. Jay said, what the heck happened here? S was walking around, checking, and suddenly a loud crash was heard. We looked back. S was gone. We scrambled to where we saw him last. We heard him yell and looked around. His cries seemed to be coming from a crawl space trap door kind of thing on the cabin. S yelled up at us to get a rope because his ankle had been broken. Now a lot of people might assume a five foot drop like that wouldn't be dangerous, but our gear weighs between 70 and 80 pounds on a normal day, and during large fires, it could contain an extra 20 pounds. Jay asked S if he could stand up. He tried. He was able to get up and lie against the wall. E tossed the rope down to him. As he was wrapping the rope around himself, he looked up at us and began to laugh. He joked, saying at least the axe didn't go up his butt. We laughed, but carefully got him out. J and E got him to the door. I went and pulled the ATV around close to him, and I got him on board. E checked his foot. No blood, which was a good sign, but his foot was swelling up like a balloon. J volunteered to take him back to base, and we agreed. E told me to grab a camera off the ATV to take photos of the scene because of the body inside. We finished up, called it in, relaying all the information back to camp. The captain told us the unit coming to help us had to be turned around and that we needed to head back ourselves, but we weren't finished with the scene yet. By the time we were done there, we realized it was mid-afternoon. E went back inside at one point, slowly walking in so as to not disturb anything of the scene. Then he called me inside. I went in and saw him pointing his flashlight into the hole in the floor. Look, animal tracks. They look like dog prints, but a lot bigger. Now, I was assuming it was a big dog. I didn't really believe in any sort of supernatural stuff. We left that cabin, and standing there right next to our ATVs, we saw something. There was this tall dog-looking thing, or perhaps some weird bear. I don't know what it was exactly, but when I saw it, I just stood there, frozen in shock. Then I was yanked backwards. I hit my back in the floor. E slammed the door shut, well, what was left of it, and he slid the charred couch and dresser in front of the door. I tried to ask what he was doing, 
but he put his hand to my mouth and glared at me as if to say, quiet. Now, E is ex-military. He'd been in the army for eight years. I've never seen this man show an ounce of fear, but there he was, pale white. He looked how I felt. He began to look around, axe in hand. He checked the three windows without touching them, but the one that was broken he covered with a small end table that he stuffed quietly to the frame of it. We both looked at each other then, not saying a word. Then we both remembered there was a massive hole in the floor. We looked around, then had an idea. We flipped the kitchen table onto its top, then slid it over the hole. We were thankful it was big enough to cover it. I whispered over to E. We're gonna have to leave soon. But he told me to simply listen. I wasn't sure what he was talking about. He shushed me and said listen again. What? All I hear is the wind and fire. Exactly. Something that big out there has not made a single noise. We called the captain up on the radio. We said we were stuck in the structure as it collapsed and we needed evacuation. We heard them say that Metaflight was on its way. We let them know to be cautious as a frightened bear was in our vicinity. The captain acknowledged that information. You think we can make it to the ATVs? I asked E. He paused before he said anything, and he looked at me. I'm not sure. Did you see that thing's hands or paws or whatever the heck it had? No, no I didn't. I just saw its face. You think it's some idiot in a ghillie suit? No way that was a person. Too big. Those who know how tall ATVs are, this thing's knees were about the height of the handlebars. Outside, it looked as if it was getting dark out. In reality, I think the winds had shifted and smoke began to push towards us. We knew we'd be in trouble soon. Plus, we had less than an hour of air in our tanks. The timer on our watches began to sound. Suddenly, the back wall where the bathroom was at sounded like someone was kicking a bass drum as hard as they could, just louder. We shot straight up, axes in hand. Then, even through our helmets, we could hear this deep growl. There was such bass to it. We could feel it in our chests. We were only a few feet from this thing, and all that stood between it and us was a weak door. Adrenaline and fear coursed through my body. We heard the helicopter coming closer. E spoke. We need to move closer to the door, now. We rushed to the door. I pushed the small couch out of the way as E knocked the shelf out of the way too. We pulled the door open. Then, as we did, the table over the hole flew straight up, and this brown furred creature stood up there. It was waist high from the hole. The two of us ran out, shutting the door hard behind us. Metaflight was just overhead. They lowered a rope ladder. We quickly scrambled to it and climbed as fast as we could. Finally, after forever of climbing, we were inside the helicopter, gasping for air. He looked at me. We, we made it. I looked over at one of the medics on board. Then E told the pilot to wait. He grabbed a flare camera, and through the infrared, he grew pale. I could tell even through his dirty face. Get us out of here, he shouted. He sat back down. I could see tears making a clear path along his soot-covered face. We made it back to base, where Jay met us when we landed. He went with us to get checked out. He asked what happened. I said the building fell on us. While we rested in the medical tent, I looked over at E. What did you see through the camera? Slowly, he looked up at me, and he said simply, Six. More tears fell down his face. It took me a second to understand what he was saying. We had been surrounded. There were six of those things around and in the cabin. We were both flown to the nearest hospital, where we had to stay for a few days. After that, we were cleared to come back, and I didn't mind, but only if it meant helping out at the edges to stop the progression of the fire. On August 22nd, weeks later, they finally got it under control. Soon after that, E resigned, getting a job working as security. A few weeks back, at the beginning of October, 
E and I told S and J what really happened. J, midway through his drink, coughed and spat out his beer. <laughs> really? <clears throat> about four days before the fire, we found a group of six by a small pond about two miles away from the cabin. They all appeared normal, but they gave off this weird vibe. They refused treatment, said they'd only been in the area because their car broke down. Funny enough, we didn't find any cars, nothing of the sort on the service roads. All six of them were big guys too, about six foot four and easily over 230 pounds. I asked, could you recognize them if you saw them again? Oh yeah, you don't forget these kinds of people. They made me want to leave them there and never come back. Then he spoke up. I understand that feeling. I work with a big guy, a security guard like me. Makes me feel uneasy, like I need to get away from him. S laughed. Hey Jay, that's probably one of your werewolf friends. I laughed, tossing my empty beer bottle back into the box to grab another. Hey, Adam, he said. I looked up at him and said, what's up? He pointed his bottle towards a green pickup truck that was pulling in down the street. Uh, what about it? Well, that's the truck the guy at work drives, but the owner said he was on vacation or hunting or something. We all looked up at the truck. A large man was just getting out. We all laughed. S said, let's invite him in for a beer. The sun was setting and we all began getting ready to leave S's place. We put the chairs back in the garage, picking up the bottles from his driveway. As Jay was walking to his truck, the guy with the green truck at the house at the end of the street got into his truck and began heading down the road. He slowed down and pulled right up next to E's window while he was sitting in his car. Hey, ain't you the new guy at work? E replied, uh, yeah? Pretty chill job, ain't it? I'll catch you later. He then drove off in that green Dodge pickup, and all I could think about was how dirty that truck looked. I looked over at Jay and he stood there staring straight at the truck. I asked if he was alright. Did you have too much to drink, buddy? I added, trying to be funny. He looked straight at me. Adam, that was one of the guys I was telling you about. Warning. The following story contains harsh depictions of violence against pets. Cynthia. From Officer Nobody. I'm a young police officer in a southern city. As a child... It was my dream to become one. I made tinfoil badges and carved sticks to look like pistols. I took reports with crayons and chased imaginary criminals. Twenty or so years later, I average three hours of sleep and have grueling anxiety attacks. Like my peers, I've seen terrible things. It's what we signed up for, so I don't expect sympathy. In 2018, I responded to a welfare check where I found a two-week-old, decomposed body. The man had hanged himself with copper wire inside a closet. His skin was so rotted that it separated where the wire attached. It was an unwanted but gnarly anatomy lesson. It was mid-June, so the smell was unbearable. But hey, dead bodies were a dime a dozen. In 2019, I helped scrape a woman from the pavement following a crash. Her survived husband watched from a distance. But hey, I dealt with hysterical loved ones weekly. In 2020, I watched a homeless man burn alive inside a shed. He had locked the door from the inside and couldn't find the key. The window was too narrow to climb out of. His space heater had caught fire. But hey, the fire marshal took the report. I don't mean to sound callous or smug. I only want to depict reality. The truth is, as disgusting as those stories are, they are not the reason behind my insomnia. They are not the reason for my anxiety. Frankly, I hardly think about them. My trauma comes from 2021, where I responded to a call that haunts me every second. It was around 3 a.m. I was typing a larceny report in my car while Ozark played in the background. It was the scene where Wendy's lover gets thrown off a building and goes splat in front of Marty. Crazy scene, 
It was a mid-80s summer night amongst a full moon. By that time, everything was calm. The night shift was short-handed, so my typical beat partner wasn't working. Dispatch requested me for a welfare check. Welfare checks are usually harmless, although it is when you find the most dead bodies. Welfare checks are what they sound like, checking the welfare of a person and ensuring they're okay. The reporting party is usually a family member who couldn't get a hold of the person. I received this information and began driving. I was tasked with checking the welfare of an elderly woman who lived alone on the outskirts of town, barely within city limits. Her granddaughter lived a few states away and hadn't heard from her. She assumed that her grandma accidentally switched her cell phone to silent, as she often did. Dispatch usually sends two officers, but every now and again they'll give an officer an option to take the call alone. Because of staffing levels and the nature of the call, I decided to handle it myself. Worst case scenario, Granny bit the dust and I would call a medical examiner to work an unattended death. I drove a good 15 minutes to the residence, another 100 feet north and it would have been county jurisdiction. Lucky me, right? There were no other houses in the area. It was so quiet that the sound of gravel under my tires was thunderous. Beyond the mailbox was a locked gate and a long dirt driveway. I absolutely did not want to walk that driveway alone in the dark without my patrol car. I grabbed my radio to call for another officer, but changed my mind. I would have looked silly asking for help after committing to doing it solo. Plus, it would have been an even longer drive for them. I decided to man up, jump the gate, and make what turned out to be the worst decision in my life. If it wasn't for the moonlight, it would have been so dark that I couldn't see my feet. I was trained to be tactical with my flashlight, only using it in short bursts. It was a good way to be sneaky. I finally reached the house and stood in front of it. It was an old wooden home with two stories. Every window was pinch black, besides one on the second floor, and had a purple curtain with white stripes. I stepped on the unstable wraparound porch and listened carefully. There was nothing but absolute silence. No TV, no creaks, no fans, nothing. Tentatively, I knocked and announced myself. There was no answer and no noise. I knocked even louder and announced again, still nothing. I stepped off the porch to reevaluate the situation. Once far enough, I looked up to the second story. The light was off. Typically, something like that wouldn't creep me out but the hair on the back of my neck stood straight up. Since the light was off, I couldn't see whether someone was looking back at me. I had a terrifying feeling that they were. I grabbed my flashlight and shined it in through the window. No one was standing there, but the curtain had moved and was still swaying. I went back to the door and knocked even louder, telling her who I was and why I was there. Cynthia, it's Officer Blank with the Blank Police Department. I'm just checking your welfare. I stood there for several minutes in eerie silence. I was ready to hightail it back to the road, but figured I'd wait another minute. I had done my job for the most part. I was there to make sure she wasn't dead. If she wanted to ignore me, fine. I was creeped out, and without a partner, I wasn't going to press the issue. For some reason, before walking away, I decided to try the doorknob. This isn't usual practice, since it could be deemed a violation of the Fourth Amendment. I couldn't enter the home without a warrant, exigent circumstances, or permission. To my surprise and regret, the door opened. Apparently, the heavy wooden door needed its hinges tightened, because it slowly opened all the way until it knocked against the wall. I shined my light inside. It was definitely an old woman's residence. Everything was lavender and tidy. There were creepy portraits of hairless cats in the walls. There were also statues of them. I reached my hand inside to flick on the light, but it didn't activate. At first, I thought the house had no power. There were no sounds of electricity at all, and it was hotter than a sauna with no airflow. Then I remembered the light upstairs. The whole situation was odd and unsettling. I decided to dial my supervisor to get his opinion. 
I was hoping you would tell me to leave, call the reporting person, and explain what I observed. Before I was able to dial, I heard a sound which haunts me every night. A chilling noise that will die with me. You won't believe me and I don't blame you. It was the sound of intense laughter. Not a giggle, but delirious, gut-busting laughter from what sounded like an old lady. I never drew my Glock faster than I did right then. Hello? Who's in there? Before I could finish the sentence, it stopped. I'm not too embarrassed to admit that I turned around and bolted for my car, gun in hand. Just as I left the porch, I was stopped in my tracks. Another equally loud and terrifying noise echoed from the house. This time, it was a scream of someone clearly in distress. It sounded like the same voice, but I wasn't sure. Dang it, I thought to myself. Exigent circumstances. I radioed dispatch and told them what I heard. I advised them that I would be clearing the house. Another officer started en route, but I couldn't wait. I wanted to, but there was no way I could explain waiting 15 to 20 minutes to enter the house of an elderly woman in danger. I entered the hot living room and cleared the immediate area. I knew at least one person was upstairs. The narrow staircase led to a pitch black second floor. Before going up, I announced myself again, and again, to no avail. I began walking up the staircase as calmly as I could. I remember imagining a scenario where I'm clearing the bedrooms and Cynthia pops out of a dark corner. I'd have to explain to the reporting person why I shot her grandma in the face. When upstairs, I checked two rooms that were completely empty. No furniture or anything. I then realized that the last bedroom was the same one that had the light. I announced myself and prayed for a response. I didn't get one, so I grabbed the doorknob and twisted. I swung it open and was immediately met with a nauseating odor. It was the worst I'd ever experienced, almost knocking me down. I illuminated the room with my light. In every corner, on every wall, were dead, skinned cats pinned to wooden crosses. Some were rotten, some were fresh. There was dried blood literally everywhere. Fur and detached claws covered the floor. I dry heaved as I cleared the closet. It was empty. I stumbled my way back downstairs where I vomited on the front porch. I ran to the road to wait for my partner. Once he arrived, we called for even more people and my supervisor. We cleared the house again with no signs of Cynthia. Fast forward to the next evening. The reporting person flew in with other family members. They searched the ten or so acres and found an old abandoned car in the brush. They found her grandma there, leaned back in the passenger seat, deceased for what appeared to be several days. Neither detectives nor the medical examiner would determine the cause of death. Detectives interviewed another family member who said Cynthia had severe schizophrenia and dementia. Inside her home in a kitchen drawer, detectives discovered pages and pages of Hebrew writings. The writings translated to devoted allegiances to the devil Tarot, a devil god that many Satanists worship. Her writings claimed that Tarot asked her to sacrifice her beloved cats. Some believe that I heard Cynthia's laughter and scream and that the upstairs light was on. Some don't. Trust me, sometimes I question it myself. For some reason, my body camera never downloaded to the system. It's like the footage never existed, even though I know it was on. No other calls from that night downloaded either. It even baffled my department. I have constant nightmares about Cynthia. In them, she's laughing with the same terrifying laugh. She has unusually long fingers and nails that almost scrape the ground when she walks. I never move fast enough to get away from her. I reach for my gun, but it's never there. She always gets me, and then I wake up. I don't know why I'm still a cop. Maybe it's all I know how to do. I only have 12 more years and many, many more therapy sessions before I can retire. 
I wasn't a supernatural believer before my experience, but I am now. To those aspiring to be police officers, heed my advice. Be a firefighter instead. I'm glad I didn't accept that ride. From Kingly So, this is something I need to get off my chest, as I've never told anyone before. A few years ago, I experienced the strangest thing that's ever occurred to me. Honestly, my skin still crawls every time I think about it. At the time, I was in my mid-twenties, a college dropout that was just struggling to survive paycheck to paycheck. Back then, we only had one POS car. She was a very old pickup that we had named Gladys. In all honesty, she was only being held together with duct tape and wish. However, she was always reliable, and I thank the Lord every day we didn't have to live in her too. In fact, if it wasn't for my then boyfriend, now husband, for the sake of this story we'll call him L, I would most certainly be homeless. At the time, only having Gladys ultimately wasn't a big issue. We worked opposite schedules. With L being an overnight floor manager at a warehouse and me being on a day shift, it at least made transportation simple. In the mornings when he got off, I would pick him up and he would drive me to work before he headed home to sleep. Then at night, he would get me. We would switch and I would take him back to work before I went home to rest. Anyway, on that day, it was a Wednesday, which is my Friday basically, I was very ready to have my two days off. I worked 10-hour shifts at a local-owned mom-and-pop shop. I won't say which, for obvious reasons. I was paid in peanuts and had no benefits. But hey, it paid the bills. L dropped me off a few minutes early, gave me a kiss goodbye, and I gave Gladys a pat on the tailgate before he drove off. I always arrive early so I can get my drawer pre-counted and ready before we officially open at 10 a.m. Due to this, the owner, who we'll call R, gave me third key privilege, which really just means more work and responsibilities without the extra pay. I unlocked the door and stepped inside, taking off my jacket to take it to the office. After grabbing my paperwork from the safe and counting my till, I saw R pull up and park in the back. She had a tradition of sitting out in her car for about 10 minutes and having a smoke before she came in. She referred to it as a pre-shift meditation. Not being a fan of smoking myself, I just call it a bad habit. Anyway, she stepped inside and threw me a surprised look as I smiled at her. Morning, R. I chirped. How was the meditation? She blinked a few times before looking over her shoulder. Oh, sorry, sugar. I thought I saw you out back by the dumpsters when I was walking up. Assumed you were tossing trash you missed last night. Now it was my turn to be confused. Uh, nope. I think I'm here currently, I said, giving myself a pinch on the arm. Ow, yeah, I sure am, unless you're going around mistaking me for homeless people. I exclaimed playfully. R gave me a stern look before cracking a smile and crossing her arms. You really are a ham, ain't you, boy? She rolled her eyes and walked past me to the office. Hey, she threw a look over her shoulder. Do me a favor and count up your till. It's bank day. I need the deposits. Yeah, you got it. I already counted the tills, so all you need to do is get the deposit from the safe. She gave me a wide smile. Thank you, sugar. You're always on top of it. Aside from a few fickle and rude customers, it was a good, smooth day. Our favorite regular came by to get her pack of gum and a six-pack of beer. She looked like a tanned, bleach-blonde leather handbag. Truthfully, she was a hoot, and I kind of wished she was my aunt or something. She was always telling just the most outlandish stories from when she was young. After I took my lunch, the rest of the day played out on fast forward, all the way up to 7.15. That's 45 minutes before closing, and there were no customers in the store. I tried to fight the boredom. I really did. After ho-humming a bit, I decided to go to the office and check my phone. My heart sank, however, when I saw three missed calls and a text from L. Hey babe, I'm sorry for the last minute message. My sister was in an accident. She was clipped by a car while on a bike ride. Her leg's broken and has a pretty bad road rash. They have her doped up on the good stuff right now, and the doctor said she will be okay. Thank God. Will you be able to order or find a ride to the hospital when you get off? I need you here. I felt sick as the tears in my eyes began to fall. 
I read the message a second time and clutched my chest. My God. I looked at the clock, 7.20. I needed to go. After tearfully explaining what was happening to R, she nodded and put her hand on my shoulder. Eh, 40 minutes never hurt anybody, right? Just count up the tills and go on and get, she said, giving me a sympathetic smile. You gonna need a ride, sugar? Considering I usually have a bad reaction to cigarette smoke and that her car probably smelled like an ashtray, I politely declined. No thanks, I'll just order a ride through one of the apps. She gave my shoulder one last squeeze and I grabbed my till to count. I didn't waste any time at all. After I finished up, I said goodbye and headed out the door. I ordered a rideshare and waved R off as she pulled out to the lot exit in the back side of the store. The app said it would be about 10 minutes. I bit my lip and cursed to myself, and in my panic I began pacing. Stay calm, I thought. All will be well. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw some movement going around the back of the building. What was that? I said to no one in particular. I unlocked my phone and checked the app again. It now said 15 minutes. I tapped my foot nervously and looked back where I saw the activity. I got time to check it out, I whispered to myself, and against my better judgment, I started the short walk to the back of the building. As I rounded the corner, I saw another stir of movement and froze. There was a person standing by the dumpster. Even though their back was turned to me, I immediately recognized the short, stocky shape of the store owner. I breathed a sigh of relief and began walking closer. Jesus Christ, R. You scared me, I blurted. Look, I I'm sorry I goofed on you earlier, but this is just mean. R turned around to face me, and my heart skipped a beat. I stopped, dead in my tracks. Suddenly, I got a strange feeling as she locked eyes with me. Oh, hey, she smiled. I felt bad about your situation and thought I'd offer you a ride again. I felt my mouth go dry. The way the words slipped from her mouth sounded so odd, but also strangely inviting. It was correct, but so wrong. Um, okay. Cool. Well, I appreciate that, but I already ordered a ride. I don't want to put you out, I responded. I fought the urge to run. For all I knew, it was just a tone-deaf joke. Oh, come on, buddy. I can get you there safe. She was still smiling that smile. It softly beckoned me like a Venus flytrap. However, the way she spoke made me flinch. The odd emphasis on certain words and drawn-out nature made me both want to run to and away from her, like trying to fight the urge to vomit, a push and pull on my now trembling body. Just then, my phone pinged and I glanced at it. My skin went cold. New message from R. Hey, sugar. I'm hoping you're still there. Do me a favor. I got halfway home before I realized I didn't lock the door. You have your key, right? I glanced back up to whatever I've been speaking to for the past five minutes. This time I looked closer and started to notice the little things, the subtle mistakes in the visage of what stood before me. The thing that was only pretending to be R shifted ever so slightly. Its eyes were a little too big and its smile a little too wide. Its skin looked a little too tight and the teeth a little too sharp. I began to sweat as its eyes flicked down to my phone and back up to me, never losing that smile. What's the matter, love? Don't you need a ride? It cooed. I shook my head. No, uh, really, th that's okay. I gulped nervously, taking a half step back. I I'm all set. Just then, like a sign or a twist of fate, or sheer dumb luck. My app went off, informing me that my driver had arrived. I cleared my throat and backed up a little more. <clears throat> I gotta go now, so uh, bye. Without missing a beat and downplaying the awkwardness of that farewell, I turned on my heel and began to calmly walk away. Calmly, that is, until I dared a glance back just before turning the corner. 
Now, the fake R was nowhere to be seen. That prickle of fear struck me, similar to losing track of a spider in your room. After that revelation and the absence of a presumed threat, the flight response fully kicked in and I ran like a little punk. I'm not ashamed to admit it. After apologizing and giving an excuse to a very startled driver, I finally got the heck out of there. It took everything I had during the 20-minute ride to the hospital not to burst into tears. I had so many questions. What on earth was that thing? Was that the same thing that R saw this morning? Did it pretend to be me and try to speak to her? How did it know about L's sister? Was it there all day listening to us? I shuddered at the thought. Why didn't it chase me if it wanted me so bad? Maybe I had to agree with it on my own. I unfortunately would never find out the answers to these questions. I quit the job immediately, doing my best to remove it from my memory. I never told L about it, so I was horrified when he brought up R the following week. Whoa, hey babe, looks like that lady that owned the store you used to work at went missing yesterday. I nearly dropped my phone when he said that. What? He gave me a soft look and patted my hand. Apparently, R's car was found at the store yesterday morning by the leather handbag lady. She was not inside, so she made a report with the police. They never found her. To this day, I still occasionally pray for R. I pray that she's okay and is hopefully just missing. I also pray that if that wasn't the case, and whatever happened to her was by the hands of that thing, that it was fast and merciful. Finally, I pray the hardest that the last thing she witnessed before she vanished into thin air wasn't something that was pretending to be me. Goblin Creature Attacked My Dog From William F. This is quite possibly the most intense and strangest encounter I've ever had. Not only did it happen to me, but also my dog and my friend's dog too. In our local woods, there is a path beside a cliff face, and on those cliffs are a series of small caves that we call the Banana Caves. I was never sure why they were called that, but if I had to guess, it's because they were made of limestone and had a slight yellow tint to them. Maybe it was the shape of the caves, but that's not really important. The path we walked was frequently walked by many people. Locals, dog walkers like us, bird watchers, you name it. It's not exactly a quiet path, which is why this was as shocking as it was. My dog and my friend's dog are great, and they're amazing off their leashes. They just go and do what they need to do and don't bother anyone or any other dogs. Of course, dogs will be dogs. Mine being a bit of an adventurer, it began climbing the bank that day toward the cliff face and near the caves. I tried to call him back down more than once. At one point, I called him again, but something had caught his eye. His head went real low to the ground, and his ears went straight back. I thought this was strange, because if it was a rabbit or a squirrel, he would have just chased it. But no, he stood as still as a statue. I shouted louder this time for him to come back down the path. Then there was a huge commotion. He went into fight mode. He backed up while barking and snapping at whatever the heck it was. I began to climb the bank myself in a panic, making sure it wasn't a badger or worse. My dog charged forward, and that was it. He yelped and barked, and it was awful. What I saw was this monkey-like creature with pointed ears. It had no fur at all that I could see. It was black and leathery, with black eyes. It had latched onto my dog's neck, hanging onto it, like the way a sloth would do to a tree or a caretaker. My dog shook and rolled fiercely, but this thing just held on. It felt like ages before I finally reached my dog. I'd been running as fast as I could up the bank. My friend's dog joined in on the commotion as she ran past me and began barking and snarling at this creature and my dog. As I got closer, I picked up a stick and instantly swung at the little creature, terrified it was seriously hurting my dog. 
I hit the thing directly in the back of its head, but it didn't budge straight away, so I hit it again, and this time I cracked it against its back. The creature then jumped off my dog, just like you'd imagine a monkey would. I got a look at it again and noticed it had a bat-looking face with two sharp front teeth. It did this little spin and looked like it tripped sort of, but eventually it dashed off on all fours, climbing up the cliff face and disappearing over the cliff edge. Luckily, my dog was pretty much unharmed. He had a slight cut above his eye, a cut on his nose, and a cut on his chest that looked worse than what it was. There was just a lot of blood. I have no idea what this thing was, but my friend saw it too from the bottom of the bank and confirmed the exact same thing I saw. I believe it to be a goblin of some sort. Otherwise, I have no idea. If you have any idea, please enlighten me. I'd love to find out more. I live in the northeast of England, if that helps. College Night Shift from Eva Fan 33 I used to work part-time at the college where I studied. I took courses in the IT field, and each semester they would hire some students to work entry-level tech positions, granting decent income and great experience. Being one of the lucky few to get a job, I didn't complain when I was rostered over to the night shift. My role was a lab proctor. Usually I was tending to computer labs, re-imaging workstations, and installing new ones. The reason there was a night shift at all was to service the instructors teaching part-time courses. There were only a few night classes, sometimes none at all, but even so, if something went wrong, we had to be there. Otherwise, a class might end up cancelled. I only had one partner in the evening hours, a girl named Kira. I was fresh out of high school and she was a few years older than me, but we got along well. Similar senses of humor and all that. Things were pretty seamless for the majority of the term, until we hit the first day of December. I'm going to recount it to the best of my ability. Hopefully you don't mind the details, but I want to go as in-depth as possible. So I met Kira in a laboratory on the third floor of one of the campus buildings. I'd come early, but she was already waiting for me. This was the default location for the proctors. Usually, we didn't spend much time there. We would just set our stuff down and then go follow up on tickets or jobs that were sent out. Our boss, Harry, wasn't there that night. Not like we really needed him anyway. He'd sent out an email beforehand informing us that he was not available, and he'd attached tickets we had to work on. There were five or six of them, and we had from 4pm to 12am to finish them up. The first one was to re-image a lab. This meant we would be installing an operating system on each computer in a certain room. The lab was in another building. It was a large campus, and the place we'd need to head over to was about a six-minute walk. Whenever we went out, we were supposed to take proctor phones with us. They were normal smartphones, the key difference being they had the instructor helpline forwarded to them. It was essential we carry them around to answer any call that might come up. That's why I found it weird Kira didn't take hers. She seemed to forget. So I gave her one and grabbed the other, also taking my laptop with me to update the inventory of the lab. Odd things began to happen when we stopped in the elevator. I punched the button for the ground level, and the doors closed. But before the elevator started, the two of us heard this scratching noise. That's the best way I can describe it. It sounded like an animal, maybe a raccoon, dancing on the roof of the elevator with its nails grazing the metal. I knew for a fact the sound wasn't there when I'd gone up, so I was sure it wasn't the hardware of the elevator. I made a comment about it. Kira seemed indifferent, though. In fact, she was awfully quiet. Anyway, the elevator reached the ground level without issue and we got out. The exit was right in front of us then, and we headed through. From there, we started our walk to the building that housed the lab. The sun had already began to set. It was the middle of winter, after all, and it was chilly. After another few minutes, we got to the building. The doors were automatically locked at 4pm each day, so we needed to swipe our access cards to get in. Despite the smart security on the door, this building was a lot older than the others. The air conditioning seemed defective. It was incredibly hot and muggy when we entered. 
The lab in question was on the bottom floor of the building, so we took the stairs to get down. Once we made it to the lower level, we were greeted with a hallway. It was dark and rather ominous. Even worse, the lights were buggy. Only the one directly above our heads came on. The rest in the hallway started to flicker. Almost all of them were spotty and inconsistent, except for the one at the very end, which didn't turn on at all. We didn't mind terribly, though. There was enough light to make out the room designations. The lab we were looking for was right in the middle of the hallway. We walked up to it, and Kira swiped her card to open it up. Only nothing happened. The card didn't seem to trigger the reader at all. It didn't spit an error, it just ignored it. So I swiped mine, and the door opened up. As we got into the room, we noticed something bizarre. One of the computer chairs, the one at the far corner of the room, was spinning. Quickly, too. It was like someone had just slammed it as hard as they could. No one else was there, though. Even weirder, inertia should have slowed down the chair, but it just kept spinning, like its velocity was continuously being refreshed. We both looked at each other, then I went over to it, freaked out but trying not to show it. I grabbed the chair to stop it from spinning. It froze, but as it did, this sensation of ice crept over me. It was like when you swim in a pool in the middle of winter, then get out and feel the exposure on your skin. Only it was just on my arm. I must have freaked out a little, cause Kira asked me if I was okay. I said I was fine, and then the sensation went away. Like there one second, gone the next. After I recovered, I was going to make a comment about the chair, but she had already gotten to work so I didn't bother, instead following her lead. It seemed to me she was having a rough night, because she fumbled with the keyboards, apparently forgetting how to open up the boot menu. So I took over her machines for her. It wasn't hard work after all. She sat down and watched me, looking very tired. It took about 15 minutes to begin the imaging process on all the computers. I read over the next ticket. It involved pulling up a workstation in a different lab back to the proctor room to diagnose it, because it had some hardware issues. I checked with Kira to make sure she was okay staying in the lab by herself. She didn't have a problem with it, so I left. I did feel uneasy about her being alone, though. I didn't really know why. Something bothered me about it, but I knew it would be redundant for both of us to wait there. So off I went. As soon as I stepped into the hallway and shut the lab door, the scratching sound returned. It was right over my head then, in the ceiling. The exact same sound from the elevator in the other building. I could hear it more clearly without the noise of the cables moving up and down. It sounded less like a raccoon and more like a dog. There was some weight to whatever creature was making the noise. It seemed to be digging, furiously, as if it was trying to get through the ceiling. I tried to ignore it and headed down the hallway, but the sound followed me. Every fluorescent light I passed turned off, like whatever was making that sound up there was cutting the wires. Paranoid, I sped up and eventually reached the end of the hallway. The noise followed, and quickly, it cut off the very last light. Freaked out and a little frustrated, I yelled something along the lines of, Enough! And just like that, the noise went away, as if it was never there. I was really anxious at that point. I think I tried to rationalize it as I passed living between levels of the building. Just as I was about to take the stairs up to the ground level, though, I remembered Kira. My stomach dropped as I thought of her. It was the same feeling of uneasiness. Not necessarily for her safety, either. I just felt strange. It's hard to explain, but anyway, I ran back down the dark hall and opened the lab door to check on her. To my dismay, she was gone. The chair she had been sitting in just before was empty, but now it was spinning rapidly just like the one from the first time we entered the room. I didn't know what to do. I was beyond freaked out. I spun around, pale as a ghost, when I heard the door to the lab unlock. Lo and behold, it was Kira. She was fine, apparently, even smiling, unlike when I had saw her previously. Then she asked me a confusing question. Hey, why didn't you wait for me? I blinked, confused. She told me that she had arrived in the proctor room to find it empty, 
with me and the phones already gone. She had to look up the first ticket to find out where I was, and then she came and found me. I just sort of stared. I must have given her this look because she was like, what's wrong? Then I explained to her that I had met her earlier that shift, and we headed to the lab together. She looked at me like I was stupid. She iterated again that she had been late and had to look up the room to find out where to go. I think I snapped then. I said something along the lines of, if this is a joke, it's not funny. She asked me what I was talking about. That's when another realization set in. When you're in some freaky situation like this, you don't sweat the small stuff. You don't take in every detail. So I only realized then that Kira was wearing something totally different than what I'd seen her in before. There were two possibilities. Either this was some elaborate prank where she left, changed, and came back, all the while messing with the lights, or there was something really bad going on. That's when I decided to check. I told her that she had taken the proctor phone and she insisted she hadn't, saying both phones were gone by the time she'd gotten there. So I took out my own phone and called the number of the proctor phone she had, fully expecting it to ring from her pocket. But it didn't. The dial tones played, but the device itself must have been too far, because we didn't hear it anywhere. Kira looked at me, annoyed, and I was about to apologize for accusing her of lying before I was cut off. Someone answered on the other side of my call. I heard nothing at first, but the dial tones had stopped, and it didn't reach voicemail, so I knew someone had picked up. Immediately, I put the phone into speaker, mouthing the word, listen, to her. We both stood there silently. As I turned the volume to max, we picked up on a noise. It sounded like breathing, faint but audible. Someone absolutely was there. Kira, who wasn't half as freaked out as I was, decided to say something. Hello? Immediately after she spoke, the breathing stopped, only to be replaced seconds later by this heaving, like laughing but dry almost silent, the only noise coming from the diaphragm changing shape. It went on for 15 seconds. We both listened, wide-eyed, before the call dropped without warning. The other person had hung up. Kira took the phone from my hand and called back more than once, but whoever or whatever it was did not answer again. I wish I could say it ended there. I want to tell you we decided to pack it up, call it a night, and leave after that. But we didn't. Kira was headstrong, convinced it was some prankster messing with us. And I, scared as I was, wasn't going to leave her alone. So, we kept working. Maybe two hours later, we finished up the first ticket in the lab, finalizing every install, then moved on to the second, hauling a computer back to the proctor room. Everything was good for a while. After we got the machine in the door, Kira said she was going to use the restroom. It was only a few doors down, so I didn't raise an issue. I nodded at her, moving the computer into the room to hook it up to a monitor and begin diagnosing what was wrong. When I got to the desk, though, I jumped. On the table was the missing proctor phone, the one that we had called. It was just sitting there in its usual basket. I know for a fact only me and Kira were on duty, no one else should have had access to that room, and she hadn't left my sight until we got there. So how in the world was it here? Suddenly, the door to the room slammed. I'd left it open so she wouldn't have to swipe to get in, and it slammed hard. I knew someone had pushed it. Now focused less on fear and more on my coworker's safety, I got up, running over to the door and yanking it open. I was met with a dark hallway, like totally dark. The overhead lights that were up 24-7 were all offline. The only reason I could see at all was because of street lights seeping into the mini glass panels of the building. Focusing, I turned my phone's flashlight on. It was pitiful in the huge college hallways, but it made them walkable. I called Kira's name. There was no response, so I began walking to the restrooms. On my way, I passed by a classroom and the door creaked open as I walked. It was so eerie, slow and drawn out like a horror film. 
I found it impossible that a door like that could have been so terribly lubricated. Regardless, I continued on. The washroom was just up ahead. I used my phone to identify which of the doors were for women. It was held open by a door stopper, so I entered. I called Kira's name again. Still, no reply. I felt a little weird about going into a female bathroom, but given the circumstances, I really had no other choice. Shining my light around the room revealed no one. It was small. I could see almost every corner, and Kira was not there. The only thing amiss about the room was the stall door. It was swinging back and forth, making no noise at all. Just like the chairs from before, it showed no sign of slowing down. I remember being mesmerized by it, standing still to watch it glide. I was snapped back into reality from the sound of footsteps in the hallway. Immediately, I shot back out, calling for Kira again. By the time I'd exited the restroom, the footsteps were already down the corridor and behind a corner. It sounded like the other person, whoever it was, was running. So I ran after them. It was like something from a cartoon. No matter how fast I ran, they always stayed a little ahead of me. I could never quite reach the person, but I was always close enough to follow. I was led up and down stairs, down all sorts of different hallways until finally, it stopped. I was huffing and puffing as I turned past the last corner. There was only one door there, and it was ajar. I recognized it as one of the School of Health classrooms. I caught my breath, now irritated that I'd been led around the school. Then I walked up, shouldering the door open. The room was entirely dark. I reached over for the manual light control, flicking it up. It was able to override whatever had kept the hallway lights off, and it turned on illuminating the room. Oh man, I wish I didn't flick the light switch on. There were skeletons. I don't mean real skeletons. It's one of those models you've probably seen in science classrooms. About the same size as a human one, but made out of plastic or some composite material. Anyway, in every single chair sat a model skeleton. They were all turned to face me. It was horrifying. Who the heck had set up all these, and when? As I took a step backward from them, there was an ear-splitting noise. I blinked, and every jaw fell off the skeletons in unison, clacking to the floor, like they were all severed off. There I was being stared down by an army of jawless model skeletons. Right away, I noped out of there. As I ran, I could have sworn I heard plastic joints cracking as if they were pursuing me. I took the nearest exit, pushing out of the building into the cold night air. I remember taking a minute to catch my breath and process what the heck had just happened. I wanted to run, so badly I wanted to run, but Kira was still in there somewhere. She wasn't picking up her phone. I even called our boss Harry, but he didn't respond either. At that point, I was fed up. I think I was going to call the police, but was trying to work out how to get across my story without sounding insane. Then, something caught my attention. I could see a shape moving but not very quickly. It was very timid. It was obviously a girl. Kira. Even in the low light, I knew it was her because of the short crop of her hair. She walked out of the shadow and onto the path. It was so weird. Ten feet away, she faced away from me, dead center in the middle of the walkway. I remember calling out to her. I wasn't thinking. If I was thinking, I would have known something wasn't quite right but I was too worried about her and too glad to see her again to be careful. I said her name, and then she started heaving. Facing away from me, she was doing this convulsive motion, like she was hysterically laughing. Only there was absolutely no sound coming from her, none. It went on for minutes, the same horrifying movement. I backed up, slowly to the door I'd exited from, automatically swiping my door and pushing on through. When I turned back only a few seconds later, she, if you can call it that, because it obviously wasn't Kira, had disappeared from the path. As soon as she was gone from my view, the lights turned back on. The entryway of the building was illuminated once more, as were all the hallways. I could move about again without my phone's flashlight. Very carefully, I headed upstairs as quiet as I could, then to the proctor room. My plan was to grab my stuff and book it out of the building, 
calling the police on my way. Quickly, I swiped the card and shouldered my way into where my backpack was. Kira was waiting for me. She had the computer we'd brought on up on a table with its side panel off. She was busy working on it. She didn't even turn her head to me, only saying something like, Oh, hey. I was so glad to see her, the real her, that I ran up and hugged her. She asked what the heck I was doing, and I told her I'd gone searching for her when the lights shut off. Before I could ramble about the person running through the halls, and the model skeletons, and the other version of her that was doing that heaving thing, she cut me off. She told me that when the lights shut off, she left the bathroom and came back to the proctor office to find me. Apparently, she began working on the computer, and I mumbled something about completing another ticket before I walked out of the room. And after that, despite her protests, I made us pack everything in. We grabbed our things and left, Kira complaining the entire time. I never gave her a real explanation. I couldn't. I just needed to get us both out of there. That's really it. I'm sorry for the length of this story. I wish I could give some detailed explanation or round off with some cliche about seeing a silhouette standing inside one of the buildings as we left, but I can't. It ended as quickly and strangely as it began. The only reason I remembered this story is because Kira hit me up recently. We hadn't seen each other since the beginning of the Rona thing, and she wanted to reconnect. We planned to meet up next weekend to get drinks. In her text, she joked about finding out why I made us leave that night. I thought drafting this up might help me find the words to explain it to her, if I decide to explain it at all. As for what entity or phenomenon was in motion that night, I haven't a clue. Maybe someone out there does know, though, and will heed my story as a warning. I do know that whatever it was sincerely enjoyed freaking me out, though. Take that how you will. Good luck on your night shifts, everyone, and stay safe. My Traumatizing Encounters with a Murderer From Cody Back then, I was eight years old and living in California. I'm here to tell you that some people are freaks. This happened in my hometown, which I won't name here for privacy reasons, but I will say it's a small rural town in California near the Oregon border. One day, I was walking back home from my school which was about a 10 minute walk from where I lived. As I said, I was eight years old and I never thought anything bad would happen in a small town like that. Everyone knew everyone or so we thought. As I walked, a white van with no windows or license plate, I was a very attentive kid. The man inside the van said he was new to town and asked me where he could find the local Walmart. For reference, the local Walmart was about 50 minutes away. So I told him the nearest one was in another town about an hour away, and I told him the name of the town. At that, the man seemed angry. He then got out of his truck and asked me if I was giving him sass, because he was sure this was the right town. I was always a pretty shy kid, so this was a huge red flag for me. I ran home crying, and my mother asked me what happened. I told her and she called the police, but of course, they could do nothing, nor did they really care about some strange man yelling at me. Unfortunately, this would not be the last time I saw him. The next encounter is when I was walking with my friends to go get some ice cream from our local candy shop. We were walking together when that same white van pulled up, but this time it did have license plates, so at first, I didn't think it would be the same man driving it. Until, that is, he stepped out, asking us if we wanted some candy. My friend, David, who had always been a smart aleck, said, there's a candy shop right up the road, so we're good. At this, the man, like before, got angry, and he began to yell at us, but this time, he demanded that we get into his van. When we didn't comply with this order, he chased us and we ran away. I never understood why, but he never got back into his van to chase us with it, he always ran after us on foot. The three of us split up and ran into the woods. The road we were on, there was woods on either side of us. He singled me out because he must have recognized me from before. I decided I'm done with this and began running towards my home. From there, it would be a two-minute run. 
He kept on chasing me all the way up to my house, and when I got to my house, my mom and dad were home, thankfully. I ran in hysterical, and my mother asked what happened. I told her it was the same man, and I explained what happened this time. My father ran outside and confronted the man. My father is six foot five with a bulky build, and he was muscular back then, not someone you wanted to mess with, not to mention he had a military background. The man immediately tried to run away upon seeing my dad, but my dad easily caught up with him, threw him down on the ground, and held him until the police came. They arrested the man, and, as it turns out, the guy was wanted for murder, kidnapping, and other things of a little girl. He was convicted, and I never saw him again. I'm so glad that he didn't catch me or any of my friends, or we could have been his next victim. I still get anxiety attacks from strangers approaching too fast or someone moving too suddenly towards me. Just from the thought of what could have happened, I never learned his name, and I will never care to. To be honest, I just want to put this behind me. The Paranormal and Unexplained Happenings in My Life From Hmm, Okay These are several things that I've witnessed in my earlier years of life, and to the extent of my knowledge are unexplained phenomena. I grew up in a decent neighborhood, and I was about seven when this occurred. My house was a one-story, four-bedroom, two-bathroom house. The backyard had a short but long chain-link fence surrounding it, the place also had a basement. The basement is the center of this part of the story. It had an old flight of stairs leading down into it. That basement always felt off to me, but you could attribute that to a kid's imagination. It always smelled musky and the floor was concrete. Old wooden beams rose from the ground and ran across the underside of the floor. The light was just a bulb hanging from a wire. It had three rooms as well. The first was the largest, it housed the washer and dryer, and a bunch of boxes and the likes. The second had a hole on the back wall, and was half the size of the first and was used as storage. The third was more of an elongated closet. I walked down the old wooden steps one day preparing my laundry, but as I reached the concrete floor, I saw these eyes. Silvery white eyes reflecting light from the second room. Not just one pair, but two. Both pairs peered from that black hole in the wall. Come to find out, the house had a history. An older fellow, who I can't remember if he had that house built or if he helped in making it, died on the property. Maybe that had something to do with it. The next story takes place, I'd say a couple of months later, earlier in the morning. I just woke up to complete my daily ritual for getting ready for school. I walked into our kitchen, which had an island in the middle, where it reached a drop leading to the dining area. I just sat down to eat when there was a loud whisper. I didn't hear it clearly, but apparently my mom did. She told me it sounded like someone had said either, You don't know where I am, or You don't know who I am. We still to this day don't know who or what said that. My mom chalked it up to my dad snoring, but I didn't believe that. Fast forward to when I was 12 or 13. My parents had recently divorced. My mom, my sister, and I were all staying in a two-bedroom trailer. In the living room, we had a flat-screen TV in front of a curtained window, a couch, and a love seat. The kitchen was small, and the furthest room was my mom's which her bed took up most of the room. It was a sunny day. My mom and sister had left the house to run an errand. I'd gotten up to get something. That's when I peeked between the gap in the curtain, and standing there was this dark figure. Despite it being daytime, and the fact that there was nothing there to cast a shadow, it was somehow there. Of course, I did a double take, but when I looked back, the figure was gone. Fast forward a while, minding my own business, I hear something. It was faint, but it was definitely there. I checked all the other rooms besides my mom's. When I got to her room, the noise was a lot more noticeable, and it was coming from the other side of her bed. 
I climbed up on top of the bed and crawled over. I began to listen. What I heard that day I still remember. It sounded like a 40 to 50 year old man breathing. And the breathing was very distinct. Like when you watch a video making fun of nerds or a perverted man. But there was no source. There was no one under the bed. No one outside, no phones or the like. Just disembodied breathing. It was very spooky. Jump forward to when I was 15. We moved again, this time to a one-story house out in the country surrounded by woods. And no, the woods were not the creepy part, even at night. This house was a three-bedroom, two-bathroom house, and when you walk in the front door, you've got the living room, then the kitchen, then the hallways to the other rooms. This happened at around 11pm one night. I had my friend over and we were watching a movie. I think it was Batman. I asked my friend, for the sake of convenience, let's call him B, if he wanted a drink. I was getting really thirsty myself. B wanted a drink too, so I asked him what he wanted. When I got my reply, I went off to get the drinks. As soon as I finished pouring those drinks though, I saw this shadow crawl across the floor. It was human in shape, but a human that was on all fours acting like a dog. Its rear end was sticking up, and its shoulders were lowered towards the ground. Naturally, I thought it was B trying to scare me, which wasn't a far-fetched idea as it was something B was prone to doing. But from where I was, I could see him sitting in my room still, just watching TV. Then I thought, okay, maybe it was just our black German shepherd walking around. Well, our dog was still in my mom's room, the furthest room from the kitchen. The dog would not have been able to get back to my mom's room without me seeing. Same thing for B. There's no way either of them could get back to where they were without me noticing. Nonetheless, I asked B if he tried scaring me, to which he responded, Uh, no. I was in your room the whole time. Fast forward to me being 17 to 18 years old. I was living at my dad's out in farm country. His house was a double-wide trailer, turned into a house. In my bedroom there, my bed was against the wall. I had a window looking out towards the road and fields. At the time, I was smoking, but I wasn't blazed enough, and I most definitely wasn't smoking anything laced. I was just enjoying the cold breeze coming in from the open window. I should clarify, it's about 9 or 10 p.m. at the time. That's when I saw it. A pale, skinny, humanoid figure. At first, it ran. Then it dropped to all fours. I watched it sprint into a ditch on the other side of the road. When I say it sprinted, I mean the thing was unnervingly fast. It moved faster than anything I've ever seen. Thankfully, it spotted my stepmom coming down the open stretch of road. There's no telling what it could have done if it spotted me. When M came in, my stepmom, I asked her if she had seen what I did. M said no, but looked freaked out. Nothing ever came of it, just like any of my experiences. To this day, I'm still keeping an eye out for the supernatural. My great-grandmother's 18th century horror story from John 343 When many of us think of the 1800s, we tend to think of those cheesy rhinestone cowboy TV shows. We don't consider just how terrifying it truly was to be alive at the time. I was born in 1959. I didn't meet my great-grandmother until I was around seven, so it would have been 1966, I believe. My great-grandmother, who at the time was around 1998, was a very sweet and kind little old lady. She dressed the way that I had seen people dress on Bonanza. So for a young child, a boy especially, who was obsessed with stories of the Wild West that I'd seen on TV, I was excited to flood her with questions. At first, she told me all these wondrous stories of covered wagons, cowboy standoffs, building everything you owned, and just general stories of living in a mostly lawless time. At the time, it was the middle of summer, and my mother had told me to take my dog out to the backyard so he could use the facilities and we could get settled in for the night. Within a few seconds of my mother saying this, my great-grandmother jumped to her feet from her chair and screamed, No! Don't let him go out there! 
My grandmother walked over to my great-grandmother, putting a hand on her shoulder and whispering something in her ear to settle her down. This was kind of alarming to me, because I didn't really know this woman too well. But being a silly kid, I wrote it off and took Rowdy out to the backyard. When I got back in and locked up, the mood had completely changed. Even though I was going to be allowed to stay up later than normal, my mom told me to take Rowdy and go to bed with him. I questioned her and asked what was going on. I could clearly see my great-grandmother was very disturbed in the other room. My mother said, Jacob, just go to bed. I was not familiar with her carrying that tone towards me. I laid down after putting my pajamas on and just stared at the ceiling, not really being able to sleep. I headed downstairs to grab a glass of milk, trying to slip a few of the sweets my mother, aunts, and grandmother had made. That's when I saw my great-grandmother sitting there staring out the back window. I asked her, Grandma Caroline, is everything okay? She turned around and looked at me, saying, Do you want to know why I didn't want you to go outside? I answered, Yes, please. Believing I was about to hear another Wild West story, I grabbed my sweets cautiously, not knowing what she would say, and sat down for a story. She said, The reason I didn't want you to go outside is because I didn't want him to get you. I've seen it twice since I've been here, and I won't let it happen again. What are you talking about, Grandma Caroline? The black haint in the woods. What's a haint? Uh, honestly, it can mean a lot of things, but at its core, it means something evil. She went on to explain this story to me. When I was 17 in 1885, I saw it for the first time. My daddy, who was a Civil War veteran, decided to take me, my sisters, and my mama on a little bit of a trip to meet some men he had served with in the war. We would have to set up a camp a couple of times along the way, but we didn't care, because we were too caught up in the excitement of the whole thing. It was in the middle of summer, so we let Mama and Daddy have the tent. Me and my sister slept on blankets and looked up at the stars, just dreaming. On the second night, whenever we were settling in for camp, a family of travelers on their way through the area stopped by, asking if they could share the area for their camp. My daddy was a really good judge of character, and he didn't sense anything wrong. So he said yes, just keep to your own. They made their camp quickly and were asleep almost as fast. I woke up late in the night to see the youngest boy of the group walking towards the woods. At first I couldn't tell what he was walking towards, but I knew he didn't need to be up and about. I quickly lit a small lantern to run after him and see what was going on. Almost afraid I was going to catch him, peeing out by the wood line. And that's when I seen it. A tall, dark man with a long trench coat and big hat, like the men that we would see coming through town from time to time, looking to pick a fight or start some trouble. At first I thought it was a real man and told him to mind his own, then he looked at me, and that's when I knew this was something evil. His eyes were bright white, and when he smiled, his mouth protruded a bright steam that shouldn't have been coming out of his mouth in the middle of a summer. Before I could even react, he had grabbed the boy, and he was gone. I fainted there. I came to the next morning during a search to find the boy. He was gone and no one ever found him. I told my daddy about everything that happened. He told me to forget about it, that we were going home right away. I couldn't make sense of anything that happened. After we got home very late the next night, my daddy told us all straight to bed. I tried to lay there and sleep, but couldn't get it off my mind. Then I heard something rustling in the woods, I looked out my window, and I seen it again. That coal black son of a gun with those white eyes looking directly at me. I rubbed my eyes several times to try to make sure I was awake, and he was still there. 
I then ran to my mama and daddy's room to get my daddy, and he was gone. But then I noticed the front door was open. I walked to the open door and seen my daddy sitting on the porch with a mouthful of tobacco and a shotgun in his hand. He said to me, I know what you're seeing, and I've seen it too. It followed me home after the war. I don't know what the heck it is. It's been here for years, baby girl. Go inside. Don't worry about it. I told him I couldn't do that. I decided to sit there next to him. This godless thing stared at us all night, before eventually turning and walking back into the woods before the sun broke. We would sit and watch it, just me and Daddy, almost every night for months, when all of a sudden, he just stopped appearing. Not long after, I met your great-granddaddy, got married, and moved away. I didn't see the man again, till the night that your great-great-granddaddy died. He was lying on his deathbed at his and Mama's house. I looked out the window, and just as sure as I was standing there, he was there again. After Daddy died, I didn't see the man again until the night that we pulled up in your driveway. I saw him standing in the bushes beside your house. I don't know what he is, Jacob, and I don't know what he wants. So just make sure you stay in the house after dark and keep that darn dog in the house too. Needless to say, as of this point, I was far too afraid to go back to sleep. So I just held Rowdy as tight as I could and lay there. The next morning, on little to no sleep, I walked down the stairs to find Great Grandma Caroline and everybody else laughing and joking as if nothing had ever happened. When I questioned my Great Grandma Caroline about the conversation that she and I had the night before, she said to me, I'm sorry, honey. I don't know what you're talking about. But then a few moments later, she looked at me with a very distinct look and gave me a wink. The rest of Grandma Caroline's visit was uneventful. She left two days later, and although she would live to be 102 years old, that was the first and only time I would ever see her. To this day, I find myself looking into the dark to try and see if I can catch a glimpse of whatever this thing is, and I never have. Maybe that's for the best considering that this thing followed my great-great-grandfather home after the Civil War. I don't want to see it. War is full of death, destruction, and carnage in every way that you could imagine. So I think it kind of goes without saying that war leaves a stain on those who are around it. The Civil War was truly a dark time in American history, and we tend to not want to talk about it too often. We forget the sheer brutality that was fueling this war. Although great-grandma Caroline died peacefully in her home, my Aunt Whitney said her last words were, I see him standing there. It Hunted on Fall Nights From J.B. This is a story from when I was a child. Considering that fall is in full swing, it crossed my mind again. Back in my childhood town, when seasons changed from summer to fall, it was a big deal. Where I happened to live was almost always a toasty 100 degrees all the time, so when it finally dropped below 80 in about mid-October, it felt like a miracle. Everyone would be outside more because they didn't have to worry about the seething heat, and people were just happier. I would always love to go out with friends and play until dinner, at least until it showed up. This all started when I was about 11 years old. One or two neighborhood dogs would go missing here and there, but this would all subside by winter. It seemed to only like coming out in the fall, and everyone began to catch on. Everyone knew about this thing, but nobody talked about it. My cat, one of the first victims, even got into a fight with it at one point, and he barely escaped with his life. He was lucky. By the time I was 15, people wouldn't even leave their kids unattended when autumn rolled around out of fear of that thing. It was a thing of legend as far as I was concerned, too elusive for our paths to cross. 
at least until one day. I was driving home one night after a long shift at work. I was around 16 and a half, and I had just gotten my driver's license. I was pulling into my neighborhood like I'd done many times before. I thought I saw something behind me, so I checked my mirrors. When I looked back, something big darted in front of my car. I slammed on the brakes, but it was too late. It flew back a few feet, but immediately got up and kept running. It was all a blur, and I immediately began freaking out. What if it was one of my neighbor's pets? Or even worse, a person? I decided that I needed to make this right. I had to be sure, so I made the choice to try to follow it to see if it was injured. I couldn't live with myself thinking I'd just severely injured something and may have even led to its death. Before I left, something in the back of my mind told me to be cautious. I reached into the glove compartment, grabbing a sharp glass breaker. I got out and I noticed one thing, a trail of blood. I cringed, I'd really hurt that thing. I stepped down into the brush. The various bushes and plants were pretty high, and as I was only using my phone flashlight, that didn't help. I walked for a couple of minutes, until I heard a little kid crying. I began freaking out, I'd hit a kid, I thought. If I didn't help him quickly, I could be very screwed. I picked up my pace when suddenly out of the brush from the direction of where I heard the crying jumped this large mass. It tackled me to the ground and I dropped my phone. It snarled and grabbed at me with the intent to kill. This thing wasn't small either, it was like I was fighting another teenager. I kicked it off and reached for my pocket where I grabbed the glass breaker. It lunged at me again but this time I stabbed it right in the middle of its chest. It began freaking out, screaming these horrendous screams as it darted off into the darkness. I ran back to my car as fast as possible, driving home more quickly than ever before. I was covered in scratches and blood, but nothing too lethal. I told my parents about what had happened, but they didn't entirely believe me. In fact, my parents got me a concussion test the next morning, but it came back that I was in a good mental state. That didn't matter though because nobody believed me. At a certain point, I just stopped telling the story. Well, at least until today. All I have to say, though, is that no more pets or people went missing after that. I escaped with my life. But maybe I've saved a few more lives along the way. A cryptid crossed my path near Mount Adams. From Chuwak, 79. This happened between 2003 and 2004. I had been working for a gravel company off and on for about one to two years. My second year, I was promoted from working underneath a rock crusher, shoveling gravel, and keeping the belts clear for the rock crushing machine. It was the dirtiest job, but built character and humbled me deeply. The following year, 2004, around late summer or early fall, my boss had obtained a job up in the mountains on my res. We were crushing rock and layering it over the back roads for logging trucks. Timber is one of the main money makers for my tribe, aside from the Indian Casino, aka Legends Casino. But back to the job. We started in Old Maid's Canyon. I had my shovel ready, but my boss told me to come with him and set the shovel down. I had been promoted to roller operator. Not only was I not working the dirtiest job I'd ever worked, but my boss gave me a $2 raise for running the roller. It took me about a week to feel comfortable operating it on my own, and I was on my own by the second day, but stuck close to the rock crusher and trucks to get more familiar with the roller. About three weeks into this job, I had rolled ahead so far from the crushing site I'd rarely see the trucks. This meant I was farther into the mountains on my own. I had a CD Walkman to listen to music and drown out the very loud roller. I was deep into Old Maid's Canyon. A truck had passed me and dumped the gravel. The backhoe came in and leveled it out, and now it was my turn to pack it down with the roller. The vibration was turned on and I put the roller into gear to move forward. The truck and backhoe were gone by then. With my headphones in, I went to work. I was at least five, maybe six miles away from the crushing site. 
The roller runs slow regardless, so I can't necessarily kick the sucker into fifth and run out of there in a hurry. I was in an area where the canyon and tree line were butted up against the road I was rolling. The wind had picked up and blew in my direction. It was then that I picked up the stench of something that seemed like rotted meat and seven year strong body odor. It literally made me want to vomit. The smell was that bad. I figured maybe a dead deer or elk was nearby. I looked all around me and realized just how enclosed I was in this area. Canyon and trees surrounding me. To the left was a cliffside slightly hidden by tall tamarack trees, but I could see rock from the cliffside through the trees. I took my headphones off, pulled the roller over and shut it off. The smell had become so strong, I knew I had to be pretty close to the dead animal, or whatever was near the road. I heard rocks falling from the cliffs to the left of me. I looked over there as it caught my attention. I also heard some grunting sounds that were deep and muffled, like someone or something was trying to remain quiet running up a hill up the cliffs. I gazed through the trees. The wind picked up again, blowing that awful stench once more towards me. I realized if I can smell this thing, then it's likely that it has definitely smelled me. I mean, it was so close I could hear it struggling to climb the cliffside. Then, through the branches, I caught a sight of a patch of fur. This was fur I'd never seen before in my entire life. The body on this thing was orange and brown in color in the sunlight, the fur covering a very muscular back. People have told me it was probably just a bear. My stepdad, whom landed this job for me and drove a truck for this company, even said it was a bear himself. But I know what I saw. After spending years on the res, I've heard stories of Speelii and Bigfoot, which had been spotted by many on the reservation. The thing grunted and whooped once it reached the top. I saw a good portion of it then. To my amazement and my anxiety, it looked like an ape, but primarily bipedal. The face had some fur over it, and even though this coat that covered the body was orange and brown, it had the snout of a coyote, almost dog-like. It was like if Bigfoot and a dogman were to have spliced their genes, creating an animal in their image. It would have looked like this. This thing was like eight or nine feet tall, too. Its eyes were a sharp yellow color and almost glowed, even though it was in the daylight. It ran away then, out of my sight. What happened in those few minutes had left a huge impact on me. Realizing I was alone and miles away from people, I put the roller in reverse, backing it up and starting my way back to the crushing site. Soon the smell was gone. Everything seemed to return to normal. I might add, before it happened, I didn't realize no birds or owls or anything were around. They would usually fly past me and chirp along the trees into their nests. I noticed this wasn't happening at all then. No one believed what I saw. I tried to tell my coworkers and my now ex-stepdad. I never ventured far from the trucks after that. If I ended up alone, my stepdad left me with a pistol to keep on me, just in case I came across a bear again. I think the reason people didn't want to believe me was because they didn't want to fear anything while working so far and deep in the mountains, near Mount Adams. I believe I saw a trickster, or Spelii, and it scared me to the point that I couldn't wait for this job in the mountains to be done. Once we laid gravel on all the logging roads, I never returned to the job. My mom and stepdad ended up divorcing not long after. I was 24 at the time. The only person who believed me was my mom. Her brother, my uncle, had seen a Sasquatch while he was young. My uncle, creator bless his soul, had died tragically in a car accident when I was nine. I never got to hear his story, but he did see Bigfoot. Our mountains have creatures residing in them. Bigfoot, Spelii, UFO sightings. I never thought I'd come across something like this in my lifetime. This is one of the experiences that has happened to me. I believe Spelii had spared me that day. Instead of messing with me, it scurried away and grunted once at the top of the cliffs as if to say, you're lucky I'm letting you go, before disappearing over the top of the cliffside. These areas of the entire world exist. Creatures reside in them, and we can't even begin to comprehend them. But as a Native American myself, I believe coexisting with things, even if we don't completely understand them, is a part of life.
Then again, had it turned out that Speely I wanted to stick around and not spare me, I wouldn't be here right now to share this story. Thanks for listening. The Glowing Eyes From Ninabug, 1998 This story has stuck with me for a long time. It takes place when I was on a family camping trip. I don't remember where we were exactly. It was some spot Sarah, my mother, heard about from a friend. It wasn't a place we'd been before, but the friend, Ginny, told Sarah about it and offered us their RV to go spend a few nights there to see if we liked it. Now, something you need to know about Ginny. She was weird. Like, sits there petting a crow while sitting on the couch and having a beer while talking to people, and I'm talking about an actual crow that was mounted. Also, she was a friend of one of Sarah's co-workers at the time. So, all in all, we really didn't know her that well. But said co-worker was a very good person, and trusted by me and my parents. So I guess Sarah thought that's why we should visit Ginny in the first place. My family loved camping, and I still do, but due to living situations, I haven't in a long time. Back to the story. This camping spot was way out of the way, like Ginny had to draw a map for us to find it. It was an actual campground, but I don't remember the name anymore. It was kind of run down and gave me a weird vibe, like that feeling you get when something is off, but you have no clue what it is. Well, I was young, and I figured I just had that feeling because I'd never been there before. Now, we weren't the only people there. It wasn't like we were alone. In the area we picked to put the RV, I could see maybe four or five other spots that were being used. Now, this RV was like your basic RV in 2008. Big bed in the back, and a bunk over the driver's area. There was the couch, too. That's where all the sleeping spots were. Now, I did like to climb. I was like a little monkey. So you know I took the bunk over the driving area. It also had a big window in the front for me to look out of. I could close this little curtain, but it was pretty see-through. Like if it were daylight, I could see people through it, but not clearly at all. Basically just outlines of things. We parked the RV in this spot next to the river. We used to do a lot of fishing, so I thought that would be great. I wouldn't have to carry all my fishing stuff very far. I jumped at the chance to go fishing right away. We set everything up with the RV and I was heading for the river. It was like maybe 20-ish feet from our campsite. I set up my seat and got my pole all ready, baiting the hook and all that. In doing so, I pricked my finger a lot because the darn worm was so wiggly. Then again, all worms are. So I got my hook baited, cast it out, and sat down to wait. I waited until my butt got sore, doing the usual reeling in to check to make sure there was still bait and rebaiting when needed. You know how fishing is. During all this, I noticed a few others fishing further down. We weren't close, but not that far. I decided to be friendly and called out, Catching anything? A boy about my age at the time was the one that called back. Got a catfish about an hour ago, but nothing since. I told him, Well, something keeps still in my bait. He asked, What bait are you using? Uh, just some worms. You? Chicken liver. So we had this long-distance talk about fishing. Just because I do a little fishing does not mean I can tell you what fish it was. A bass, a catfish, a bluegill, those I can tell, but I cannot tell you if you're holding a trout or not. This boy, I'll call him Leo, was real nice about it, and showed me a little pamphlet of fish he had with him. We sat together for hours after that, talking and fishing. Leo was a really nice guy, and I wish I was still in contact with him. Anyway, Leo and his family were only two spots away from mine, and also along the river. The day was pretty normal after that. Once I gave up on fishing for the day, Leo asked if I wanted to come hike with him. By that point in my life, I had a cell phone, so when I asked my parents if it was okay to go on a hike with my new friend, they said yes. I packed up a bag with water bottles and a lunch, and I met up with Leo. Together, we walked to the trailhead. 
He told me it was his first time being at this campground too, but his uncle, who he was with, came here all the time. So, of course, I had to ask about what his uncle thought of the place. Oh, uncle says he loves coming here, but he gets good proof. Proof? That had me interested. Uh, proof of what? Bigfoot, he says, but I don't think that's what it really is. I frowned. Do you not believe in Bigfoot? Oh, it's not like that, Leo assured me. I just think he's using the wrong name for it. Now I was invested. I adjusted my bag, then asked Leo. Hmm, what makes you think that? Have you seen it? Well, no, I haven't seen it myself, but my uncle tells me about it. Leo explained. He says it's really tall and hairy, that it has big feet and makes these weird sounds, and it has a bad smell when it's close by. So far to me that sounded like Bigfoot, but I wanted to know more before just saying that's what I thought it was. I asked him what else his uncle says about it. That's when I was thrown for a loop. Leo told me his uncle said this thing had a tail and would howl on full moons. Now, to me, howling at a full moon makes me think werewolf. Of course, I don't think we have those in Iowa. I could be wrong, though. The more Leo told me, the more it made me think. This sounded like a mix of things. Wolf and Bigfoot. Was that a possibility? Was he talking about a wolfman? Keep in mind I'm young at this time. I'm into learning about cryptids and folklore monsters. So I was excited about this during the day. Because when the sun is out, that stuff doesn't scare you. At least, not as much. Well, it started to scare me when we stopped to eat our lunches, and we saw just how deep we walked into those woods. We couldn't even hear the river anymore. I told Leo we should head back after we eat, and he agreed. We sat and ate, talking about hobbies and things like, how many times have you done such and such? and just things kids talk about. About halfway through eating, Leo asked me, uh, Did you hear that? I hadn't heard anything, so I shook my head. Uh, no, what did you hear? Leo listened closely but shook his head. Uh, never mind, probably just a deer or something. Now my hyperactive imagination instantly thought, Oh heck no, that wasn't a deer. But I didn't say that. I just nodded. Besides, I hadn't heard the sound, so I couldn't say it wasn't a deer or some other animal. A normal animal. Let's just say we finished eating pretty quick and headed back. On the way back, we didn't say anything. I think both of us were trying to see if we could hear something. I'm not proud to admit it, but I did start to jog when we heard something moving behind us. You hear that? Yeah, that sounded big. Do you think someone else is out here hiking? Uh, sure. I think we were trying to keep each other from freaking out. When we got back, we just kind of chuckled at how silly we were. What were the odds the Bigfoot, as his uncle called it, was out there watching the two of us eat lunch? That stuff happens in scary movies, not real life. Of course, when these things happen to you, you tell yourself that can't happen to you, that it only happens in movies. Well, there I was telling myself just that. I get spooked easy sometimes. We headed to our campsites. I thought about telling my parents what Leo told me about why his uncle comes to the campground. But I knew they would probably just laugh. So I kept it to myself. After I got back, David wanted to go fishing, so I spent the rest of the day fishing and then helping make dinner. Overall, my first day wasn't that bad. It was the nighttime I should have worried about. After making s'mores and cleaning up a bit, I got a shower in. And by the way, why the flipping flop do RV bathrooms have to be so darn small? I may be short, but I'm round, and that shower barely fit me. Anyway, when I was done, I climbed up in my bed and closed the little curtain thing. I got all comfortable, but I've always had a hard time falling asleep. I was on my side at the time, just looking out the window. I had my music playing, listening with my headphones so my parents didn't yell at me. I was basically waiting for sleep to take me. After a while, I'm not sure how long, I got a weird feeling. 
Don't ask me why, but I pulled off my headphones before peeking out the curtain. It wasn't a full moon, but was pretty darn close. So there was a fair amount of light. I saw what I thought were fireflies at first. Then I noticed they were way too big and staying too still. And they were kinda too high, but I've seen them get high, so that part wasn't so bad. I watched them for a moment. They just sat there for a while. I was leaning on my elbow for so long it got sore. I tried to ignore it, telling myself I was all worked up because of what Leo said. It happened all the time when I heard creepy or scary stories and stuff like that. So I told myself that's what was happening, and I rolled over. I did fall asleep at some point. I told Leo the next morning, I think you got me freaked out yesterday with telling me about your uncle's Bigfoot. Leo was a little bit confused. Why, did you have a dream about it? I shook my head. No, but I swear I saw eyes in the trees last night. Pretty silly, huh? Leo looked at me. What color were they? That caught me off guard. What? What color were they? I just shrugged. I don't know, like when you shine the light in an animal's eyes at night, I guess. Dude, you had me worked up. It was probably just my brain playing tricks or a raccoon. I think I was trying to make myself feel better at this point. Leo replied, Don't go out at night and stay close to your campsite. Well, that both confused and scared me. What? Why? My uncle says so. He says if you see the eyes, you should not go out at night. I was even more freaked out. I didn't know what to do. I just told Leo he shouldn't scare me because I'd be freaked out for weeks because of it. Then he said, then let's talk about something else. I was more than happy to change the subject. We began talking about things like our pets and we went to fish. Well, he fished and I sat with him and talked. I spent most of the day with Leo when I was there, but at night I was a wreck. I would check out from the curtain at night, seeing eyes in the trees. Finally, I told Leo to come with me and went to check where I would see the eyes at night. We walked into the weeds and trees. At first we saw nothing, but then we saw where the grass and weeds had been stomped down like someone was standing there. And there were deep scratch marks on the tree, like when you put your hand against something when you lean on it. I mean, why would something just claw a tree like that for seemingly no reason? I looked at Leo. What's this? I pointed at those scratches. Leo shook his head. I got uneasy and decided to get back to my campsite. We spent the day in camp. We didn't even go to the river. I don't know why. I just felt like I should be close to the RV in case I had to run. I'm not a fast runner, and I sprint, not run. That last day there was just spent shifting around and glancing at the trees while trying to talk about something else. My family left the next day, but that last night will stick with me forever. I checked for the eyes again that night, which I had started doing every night for the past few nights. This time I didn't see any eyes. Was it gone? I'd seen them every night until then, so I thought I was safe. I went to close the curtain, but I saw something out of the corner of my eye. Keep in mind, I was already jumpy. I looked and saw something huge near the river. It was covered in what appeared to be fur, and I saw a tail. I got real scared then. So, as any smart child would do, I closed the curtain and pulled the blanket over my head. I didn't sleep at all that night. I heard something outside a few times, but I stayed under the blanket. I was too scared to look. What if it saw me? What would it do? What even was it? When I got out of bed the next morning, I didn't even get dressed. I walked out in my pajamas, which was a big shirt that covered my shorts. I looked around and saw prints. These prints looked like a mix of people's feet and a paw. I knew then it was not my imagination that night. We packed up our camp and I told Leo goodbye. We never went back. 
My family preferred our usual campground to that one, but I still wonder what that could have been. And what did it want? Was there more than one of them out there? Or was there only one? Maybe it was a family unit. It didn't do damage to anything physically, except that tree, of course. Thank you for listening to another unsettling episode of Unexplained Encounters. You can send us your story to have it narrated on the show at darkstories.org. Unexplained Encounters is an EerieCast original series. You can find other horror-themed podcasts at EerieCast.com, such as Redwood Bureau, a fictional anthology series, Freaky Folklore, a documentary-style series about myths and cryptids around the world, Destination Terror, a show about the most haunted places, and Tales from the Break Room, another show I host all about the scary things that happen to people at work. Again, that's EerieCast.com. By the way, if you want fewer annoying ads and you want to support what we do, consider going to EerieCast.com plus to sign up for EerieCast Plus. That unlocks all our podcasts with all but host red ads removed. Until next time, stay safe out there and stay creepy because this world is a strange one.